All right, here we go. Live button. All right, we're live here with the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode 168. Um, this week we have a couple of different guests. We have um, Smoky Mountain Medicinals with us. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, welcome. And in a little bit, we will also have, one second, make sure I get this right. Don't want to mispronounce it. Uh, West Valley Seeds will also be with us a little later in the evening. We had a little bit of a prior engagement, and he'll be joining us here in uh, about 45 minutes or so. So uh, uh, we also have Marty. How's it going? Hey, how's it going, everybody? Hey, Marty. Glad to see you again, buddy. Hey, what's up, Roger? Mr. Green Jeans. How's it going, guys? Hey, hey. It's cooling down. We're going to have 70-degree weather in the daytime this week, so I'm excited about that. I mean, yeah. potatoes are going to be growing like crazy. We also yeah. got Roger. Yep. We also got Roger. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I guess. Hey, everybody. I, we're looking forward to a good show. Uh, these guys from North Carolina are really cool. They got a great aquaponics uh, situation going up there. So you're going to have a lot of fun. Good knowledge tonight. And we got uh, Mr. Green Jeans. How's it going? Oh, wait. I got to put them on. I'm going to be I'm going to be around a lot more from now on. Uh, okay. Go ahead, uh, re- go ahead and start that again because you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, gr- glad to be here. It's great to be here. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I missed so many shows. I'm. I'm planning to be back more regularly from now on with my with my favorite crew. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, we take as much as we can get you. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> well, we always know you're going to be here on a seed seed bank night or a seed you know breeder night. Oh. Oh, yeah, I should try. I didn't know. I just this was just the night I could make it. <laughs> yes, it's funny because uh, you know, last time you did that was with a uh, vision, and you know what a great show that was. Just you two guys, you know. Yeah. You know that was that. All was right. Awesome. So, uh, tell us what's up with Smoky Mountain Medicinals. You guys had some really amazing pictures coming up from your farm. Yeah, we've had a, a crazy year um, or season so far. Uh, last time we talked. I think we had really just wrapped up the previous season. So the highlights, we, we actually sold Smoky Mountain Medicinals to a larger company that just formed. Um, and my partners and I are now part owners of that, which has been exciting um, because we've taken on some new capital, which has allowed us to get a totally new farm, build out a large Nexus light depth greenhouse, um, and really take things to the next, to the next level. So um, I'm excited to, to really be able to share kind of some of those stories and and maybe share some of the front lines of what's going on in hemp here in North Carolina because I tell you what, it's been kind of crazy here in this little this little quiet southern state. Things have gotten nuts and they're looking to ban hemp and they uh, they don't know what to do. So it's it's there's a lot to talk about and I'm happy to share anything. Yeah, so tell us more about that. That's pretty interesting. Um, well, I've got my buddy Jeff Bruce here. I wanted to say hey to him and let you guys say hey. Um, Thanks a lot for joining us, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff is, uh, Jeff's been helping me grow for the last year a little bit. He has his own business, but, um, you know how it is when you're working with good growers, you got to keep the the smart minds around and you want to have those good guys to keep all your ideas bouncing off of. So we're sitting out here watching the crop tonight because we've been getting stolen from, uh, over the last few evenings. So, Apologize for coming to you from the vehicle tonight, but uh, we are in defense mode. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's been a great season. We've uh, luckily not had a hurricane hit us just like it did last year. Um, the hurricane that just came by stayed off to the eastern part of the state. Um, we're having a good season. The fields are big. The greenhouses are full. Um, the big issue here in North Carolina is that they're looking to ban smokable hemp because some people in North Carolina are convinced that hemp is marijuana. And so we've now got this crazy battle with illogical stigmas. Um, and so we've got a great industry getting off the ground. A lot of us farmers are starting to make some good money. And then now the politicians want to come in and screw up all the investment and screw up all the good things that are happening here for our communities and our families. 
And uh, so really, you know, we're just, we're all kind of here just doing the best we can with it. We don't think it's going to, we don't think it's going to pass. We don't have a ban yet, but every single day there's new information coming out of our state capitol. Um, and most of the information is ridiculous, um, uninformed, uh, stigmatized talk um, that's not science-based. And I, in the South here, unfortunately, that kind of stuff gets a lot of attention. People are not very um, logical and reasonable with it. So, so yeah, we're, we've got a, an uphill battle on the, uh, the, the kind of PR front with hemp here. But in terms of the industry here, things are great. We've gone from 500 roughly licensed farmers to about 1,500 licensed farmers. Uh, we've got tons of great genetics in the state. We've got lots of people working together. We've got new um, extraction services coming online. The communities are seeing tons of new jobs. People are getting creative, inventing bucking and shucking machines. We're seeing um, all types of uh, old industry being opened up and new warehouses being rented. So we're seeing all the great things that cannabis brings to communities happening here, but we're, you know, we're battling that uphill stigma down in the capital over smokable hemp. Um, I guess we've seen recently Indiana had the same issue and the legal kind of ground there has kind of set the tone here that we think, we think it's ridiculous to try to outlaw a, a legal agricultural commodity. And uh, that's kind of, we're sticking to our guns on it. So North Carolina is, is, is kind of in shaky times for the hemp farmers. The state has kind of woken up to, they think they've legalized marijuana and the police, whether or not it's actually the police or not, I'm not sure where the money's coming from or the true lobby, but the, the, the word is, is that law enforcement can't tell the difference. The, the probable cause is this big issue. The, the dogs can't tell the difference. Um, and so, yeah, there's this heated debate now, and uh, that's kind of where okay. we are. Us farm. Where's the downside to any of those? Well, I mean, the downside is we're all investing big money in the smokable hemp products. Whether no, no, no. it's into, I mean, I mean, downside to the police not being able to tell the difference. They should stop well, picking up cannabis people in general. And you know what? That's if they can't tell, then it's time to fix the law in, in the right way, not try to come up with a different solution. Oh yeah, and that's that's what we're we're trying to say here. The reality is is that not just our state, but many states have opioid problems. I believe in this state there are thousands of untested rape kits. And the same organization, the SBI, I believe, who is supposed to be responsible for carrying out those um, um, investigations is more concerned about hemp than they are about rape cases and about real crime. And so, yeah, you're preaching to the choir here. And, and all the cannabis activists in this state know exactly that same sentiment. But unfortunately, the, uh, the kind of the old mentality and the kind of the kind of dumb Southern mind, I hate to say it, is alive and well still. And they've convinced people that this is a bad thing. And uh, I don't know, man, we're, we're just, we're in an uphill battle. You think that, um, you know, I think personally, I've seen that in other states as well, where, you know, maybe they, they feel like they're losing their grip a little bit on that old world mindset and that people are starting to realize, you know, like that some, you know, a lot of this is bullshit. Um, and when they start to lose that grip on the power and mindset and they start losing the battle, they start lashing out, right? Like, like banning yeah. him is, is a lash out move. I mean, it was just federally legalized last year. So that, I mean, that, it just seems so unconstitutional that and, and unreasonable that I, I feel like that that's a clear indication that they they know the end is coming. You know, like they're losing. No, I totally agree. But part of it also is the fact that I, you know most of you guys over there uh, have not lived in the South, so you know. And again, you got to remember, there's still people growing tobacco down here too, and they're not liking yeah. smoking hemp because that means you're not buying tobacco. 
And really, not to put a big stigma on tobacco, the m biggest stigma on tobacco is they add chemicals to it. If you just smoked regular tobacco, it probably wouldn't be that bad for you. But it's definitely not medicinally viable like hemp. And, and again, yeah, I, I can see. I knew exactly what you were talking about when you said the dogs can't tell or recognize it. They're freaking out because they're going, well, we, we know these hemp guys are growing THC cannabis, but we can't catch them. We can't yeah, catch them. The, the real problem is they might have to do some actual police work. Right. Yeah, or, or allow no, you to be. There's like, no bread and butter anymore. You know, like there's no just cruising down to get some donuts and bust in the local yeah, fucking. They literally you know, had the nerve pocket. to talk about the jobs of the police dogs at Jeopardy. When my farming jobs at Jeopardy, they were talking about how these dogs might lose their jobs. Oh no, we might have to retire some police, violent police oh, dogs mean? that are trained to maul people and violently <laughs> attack the public. We might have to retire these dangerous animals and, 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 and actually do real police work and, and, and you know maybe actually arrest real criminals instead of picking on easy, easy fines and, and lazy policing. And don't forget, those dogs are trained with our tax dollars. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we could just stop paying for them to be trained and then they would just still be dogs so <laughs> i don't really see that as being a big issue i can hey, see the reasons for police dogs aside from you know checking out hemp fields i mean so that's not shouldn't even, that's just like you said it's a knee-jerk reaction marty you know yeah, yeah it's a, and how can you I, I don't even know what precedents they could possibly get anything legally passed to be able to ban hemp um, given its current legal status. I would be really interested to, to see like even what, what grounds they're going at. Like, is it just a, like an agricultural regulation or how, what is it that they're specific, they're trying to do, do you know? Um, my, my, my understanding is it, is this, and, and this is really, it goes back to the point you made earlier that this is kind of like the actions of a last, the last actions of a dying animal. They're yeah. lashing out. And when they lash out, they do things that just don't make even legal sense or logical right. sense. And so what they're trying to do is reclassify hemp as marijuana, which again, we're still dealing with non-scientific terms. And so we've kind of, we've kind of delved into this, this non-logical thing. And I honestly think that when the courts look at it, there's just no sense to be had of it. The reality is, is it's a legal agricultural commodity and there's no way to ban any form of it because the term smokable is an adjective that isn't really definable legally. Now, if it's advertised as smokable, I can maybe see that. Maybe I can't roll it in a joint. Maybe I can't say this is smokable hemp, but, the, but hemp in a jar is just an agricultural commodity, just like corn in a jar is. So yeah. you can't ban an agricultural commodity, whether the, you can't put intent on the product unless I put intent in the marketing or the packaging, but the product itself does not have intent of smoking. It is just what it is. And so they are, they're in a legal nightmare. They don't know what they're doing. It shows the kind of idiocy of some of the leaders in the South because they're not rooted in logic. And I think the courts will eventually work this out, but it, it just looks stupid. Yeah, I'm, it's really kind of astounding, honestly. And, and when you, like here in Southern Oregon, it's pretty easy to look around and see the booming industry that, uh, that hemp has become. Um, and honestly, to me, it's, it's way better than the alfalfa in the, subsidy corn that used to get grown before that you know I, I feel like that it's a it's a huge service to the community that um that farmers are able to farm actual product for actual sales to actual people who want it and call me old-fashioned but i just like the government to get the fuck out of the way like that's really what it comes mm -hmm. down to and and if it, people make money at it then great they'll they'll spend it and that'll be good for everyone yeah, those other commodity croppers, they work for the companies that they grow for. That's it. Right. They don't have those larger companies and those seed companies and those commodity buyers. It, it doesn't work. And so 
this gives the chance to take the power and put it back into the communities, back in the farmer's hands to create these cottage industries and to create culture around it. There's no culture around GMO corn. There's no culture right. around soybean. And, and, and to be honest with you, there's, there's nothing good about the way they're treating the earth in regards to farming it. We know that. And so this is just good all in all for every farmer and every, every community. Agreed. Um, what what pest issues are you seeing this year uh, in North Carolina? Caterpillar, it's Caterpillar Central right now. Um, and that's something I wanted to talk to you about because I was I see a lot of people talking about BT and I guess um, the different proteins that it creates and the different effects that it could have um, not only on the consumer but on the on the agriculture in general on the land and so. Not only what I'm seeing here in North Carolina, but in the whole Southeast region is that it's nothing but caterpillars, nothing but talk about BT and dipel dust, um, talk about releasing, I guess, trichogramma. Um, so caterpillar is the bug of the year outdoors in the Southeast. Um, Tennessee's biggest issue, I think, in some spots is not enough rain. North Carolina spots or issues are mostly spots with too much rain. Um, and the more south you move, it's typically just more rain. But Caterpillar is the bug of the season. And I would love as much input from you guys uh, on how to maintain that and what your guys' thoughts are on BT. Uh, somebody else want to go first? I think, I think it's awesome. I, I use it all the time. I never heard of the idea that it could make you, uh, that it could make humans sick or whatever. Uh, you know, is that is that like because I mean, it doesn't doesn't the doesn't the you know the ultraviolet light uh, knocks it out and takes it. You can't even smell it uh, the second day. You know how it smells yeah. really bad yeah. when you spray it first. Like the second day, you know, it's it's pretty much. I mean, I, I I'm just saying about my experiences. I never heard of. Oh, of course. Those, those I, and therapies. my experience has been the same thing that you have had. However. I, I see chatter online and I like to try to cut through the BS and figure out what makes sense. So everything that I've seen says, you know, UV, like you said, and four or five hours later, the stuff's not even alive anymore. And the proteins that it creates don't even affect our type of um, biology. However, the information I'm getting is more from the, the crops that have been genetically modified to have the BT in the gene. Oh, and wow, they're yeah. creating allergies within that, kind of con that, that group of consumers so i don't know what okay. people's thoughts are or if there's any correlation so been, causation i've been doing trichogamma and then we've also had really good luck with um you know mantises and then also assassin bugs um because they're larger and uh, the other one you know rove beetles also will attack younger ones um you know not the larger caterpillars but they'll definitely kill them you know that first week or two before they really get some size to them so uh, along with lace wings lace wing larva um you know if you have a wasps yeah uh yeah so there's there's different um um uh, there's another um I'm trying to remember the name of it there's a, a type of ladybird too that specifically goes after cat ca uh, caterpillar eggs and i can't remember the species name i'll think of it you know, well, we were told the purple martins will go for just the general moths and caterpillars. So we're putting up purple martin uh, houses and we're looking at, uh, you, you guys maybe have seen the new companies out there applying the beneficials with drone technology. Yep. So that's what we're getting into right now. We've, we're hoping to get a grant here in the next few months to get us um, a, a couple of drones up here so we can apply beneficials all over the fields and do some spraying with some drones. That'd be really cool, yeah. Um, uh, the other thing we've had a lot of good luck with is just, we found a lot of um, uh, wheel bug eggs and put, put them on the, the plants. And wheel bugs, man, if you know what they are, one, do not ever pick one up with your hands because you'll regret it severely. But two, they are incredible for grasshoppers and caterpillars, I feel like. Every time I see one, it's feeding on a spider, a grasshopper, or a caterpillar, one of the three, when I find one. 
is that something can you commercially purchase those for beneficials or is that something that no, no, it's just, just a kind very of, large kind of it's a very large native assassin bug to oklahoma but um okay. the, we, you can purchase the assassin bugs it's a couple of different commercially a variety uh, commercially available uh, assassin bugs and again they, they go after those larger prey um you know caterpillars grasshoppers they'll even kill stuff that's you know 30 40 times their size uh, like how you know caterpillars that are way bigger than they are they'll they can bite them and kill them with they have a poison in their beak uh, so they can actually poison and kill stuff that's much larger wow yeah so there and those ones are purchasable um you can get them through arbico or you know bio i don't know if bioline has them but you can get through arbico or biobiz um or some of the other guys yeah that's that's more I, every day more information comes out about everything we've been using in the past and I've, I've just turned towards bugs instead of sprays because it just seems it seems like the right thing to do I'd I mean I'd love to get everybody else's opinion on that I don't mind spraying sulfur and some basic elemental things some hydrogen peroxide based stuff but it seems to me that understanding the beneficial bugs and their relationships to the plants is really the future of producing really clean and healthy materials well, yeah, I think okay. that on a lot of them, you have to like, especially if you're going to use something like parasitic wasp, you have to know the timing really well in your area because you want you, the wasp have to be present at the time, you know, that the, uh, that the eggs are there because that's you know, like, that's what they're going to be after. So um, if you talk to your local ag department, normally they'll give you like some pretty reliable hatch windows that you know when to release your beneficials because um you know, it's a little a little different than like spraying a plant with something when you're when you're using bugs to treat bugs. You know, you've got to use a little bit more care, and when you when you release them and understand um, how to how to keep them in a particular area. So what you know, Steve listed off a whole bunch of different ones, and and those are all great. And you may need to use them in different conjunctions depending on like what the temperature is, what the time of year it is like um, all those different things. So it's not gonna do you <clears throat> any good to release parasitic wasps that go after eggs when they're not currently laying eggs. So, uh, you, you know, you might switch up and use something like the green lacewing, like he was talking about. They're, you know, cheap, they cover lots of ground, they become, uh, their, their larva grows to a pretty good size, so they'll still attack larger ones. Um, and, and mostly they just, they just move a lot, but, understanding all of them individually and what uh, what type of environment to put them in so that they'll have the best success, I find is like really key to using beneficials. And I would imagine that's even more important when you're dealing with such a, a large field. Um, that, that and making sure you know what temperature and humidity uh, for, for each one is and, and making sure that again, like I always, I have a couple of spreadsheets that I built for myself and it has the insects and what they attack, but it also has temperature ranges factored in so that I can go and say, okay, well, temperature and humidity is this and this, and it's in this life stage of the plants. And then I can kind of match it up and go, okay, like for instance, like he talked about green lace wings, but if you were dealing with really cold temperatures at night, maybe you're a higher altitude, maybe you're in Colorado, maybe you're in, in parts of Oregon, or California, maybe you go with brown lace wings because they're more tolerant of cold temperatures. They don't go into that dormant uh, phase quite, at, you know, at, at a, it takes a colder temperature than the green lace wings, for instance, it's just, just a simple example. So, and on the other end of it, maybe you'll use temperature to get rid of them. You know, we, we've talked about multiple times russet mites and uh, both russet mites and um, broad mites, uh, you know, cooking the greenhouse, bringing the greenhouse up to a hundred and 115, 120 degrees for an hour, hour and a half to cook the um, the mites out, and then you know immediately venting the temperature down, um, and that that's worked really well for a lot of people that we know for russet mites and broad mites. So, you know, just it depends on what it is that you're doing uh, and, and what you're trying to get rid of, and and you know the resources and the scale that it is you're trying to do. But again, that wouldn't work for acreage, you know. <laughs> so. You know, at acreage. What about, like, uh, what about like some companion planting, like around like the perimeter and stuff like that, or some other plants to maybe deter the caterpillars to go for them instead of the hemp and stuff like that? You you could definitely put bait plants on there to deter them. 
um, that way, but you're, you're probably better off putting stuff that's going to attract other beneficial insects more than, than repellents per se, or, or right. even plants. Absolutely. I mean, the bait plants will help you, but caterpillars, you know, you also risk just breeding them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're really bad too. You can go out in the fields and if you've got plastic culture, you can shake a plant and you can hear the dried caterpillar shit just hitting the ground. It's that bad, man. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, there's caterpillar is, I, you know, I've had it on corn crops before, and I'm not sure if this is something that's going to be every year or if this is just going to be a real heavy year for it. I don't know much about what influences a large caterpillar crop year, but um, but that's definitely something that we're going to be putting a lot more effort into for next outdoor season because it is a uh, it's been have the main have, issue for us have you identified the species yet i'm seeing on one plant the other day i picked 27 caterpillars off of it and i saw 10 or 12 different ones that's crazy so it, i i haven't gotten through them I, I, i'm grabbing the moths um that are out in the fields and it's literally any and everything i've ever seen stuff i've never seen before in my entire life but I've well, never been paying so much attention. Well, if you're ever really stuck, you know, there's a really good consultant. Her name is Bug Lady Susan. Um, you know, she's not the cheapest person in the world, but she's the best. And um, you can take your your samples, put them all in rubbing alcohol and, you know, half pint mason jars and send them into her and, and she can get you all straightened out. Thanks. But like I said, you can always uh, shoot her an email, check out her website. And, you know, she's kind of the, the panic button call when you don't know what to do and you know you just need to to pay the right person is there a go-to plant for companion planting that you would recommend for people that i can recommend as well it, it depends on what it is you're trying to do no you know if you had a lot of aureus are you familiar with aureus aureus are another great one for caterpillars my new pirate bugs um their latin name is aureus they're a really, really, really good one because they, they'll attack a real wide range of insects, but they'll attack uh, caterpillars up to ones that are quite quite larger than themselves. And again, they're a type of assassin bug, so they have a venom um, that they have in their bite and um, uh, you know are very, very good general pest pressures. They also can fly, so they can fly from, from uh, plant to plant. So um, the downside is they can bite you uh, and leave little welts like mosquito bites. But um they're they're you know they won't be on your dried plant once it's dry oh yeah i got i got another question for you um other than the caterpillar what we're seeing in the southeast is what i've seen or known as septoria lots of fungal issues just this spotting on leaves that's septoria. definitely from some type of pathogen yeah, I've seen three different types of septoria. Um, the other one, and I'm going to actually present on this a little bit at the, I'm going to show, I have a whole slide on just viral infections that I've seen this year. Um, two different, two completely different types of mosaic virus. Uh, and then a lot of guys are seeing a leaf curl virus that's being, it was traced back to leaf hoppers. So there's leaf hoppers that are not feeding on the plants as far as causing actual crop damage but they're, so, they're they're coming off of other stuff and biting it and causing this leaf curl that leaf Is hopper that damage that's also on tomatoes right as well right yeah, yeah. so that that virus yeah. can also attack nightshades as well but mm -hmm. would that leaf that, curl like a russet mite leaf curl i think i saw you maybe identifying that on on a forum the other day but was it something that looked like a russet mite but they couldn't find russets at all and it had that same curl uh, it might have been. I can send you some reference photos offline um, if you want just some reference photos for yourself. Um, but I'll be presenting on that at the um, uh, the uh, conference here this weekend in, in Kentucky State. So uh, just out of curiosity, when I was checking into the leaf cur curl thing um, with tomato plants, um, from how I understood it, they're more of like the whole end kind of curls up back on themselves. But now I've dealt with russet mites and I know what they look on like on cannabis plants. I don't know what 
the other looks like. And as far as what I'm understanding and what I see on my cannabis plants when early on in the season when I know I've got them, that the, it's just canoeing where the whole leaf does that thing. Kind of, it's not the, it's a different curl. I don't know, would it be different on that, Steve? Let me see if I can pull up a picture. Okay. Um, of, of a reference plant. Let me see if I can pull one up here. Hold on. Or you, have you guys seen that or do you guys know? I don't know. Anybody else? Hello, everyone, by the way. Nice hey, to see you hey, tonight. Hey. Cheers. Hey, how's it going? Hope you're all having a fantastic night. Indeed. How about yourself? I'm great. And I love seeing Mr. Green Jeans here. How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you, Tara. How are awesome, you? Awesome. Awesome. I'm great. I've been watching you on Instagram, yeah, checking your here. photos out. Oh, there it is. Okay, here we go. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, so you're, Steve, this is, you're saying this is which? You're muted, Steve. Steve. Looks like, did he drop? No, oh no, I see. No, he's muted. Still getting though. used to this program here. Yeah, maybe he's just still picking, bringing up pictures. I think he's bringing up pictures for it to show us here in a minute. Wow, that's nice. What are we looking at here? Is that some sort of leaf curl? Oh yeah, there we go. But that doesn't look like uh, russet mites to me. I don't know. That that does not look like the russet mite damage that I saw on my plants. So, but that's all I can say. Steve, <laughs> are you there? Are you talking to us, Steve? There we go. Oh, there you go. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Now I can hear you. Okay. So here's, this is the early onset of that leaf curl virus. Oh, okay. See yeah. these little swirls and shit? See how, see how it, it's corkscrews? Yeah. Yeah, totally now, that, different. That one, leaf, that one leaf to the right looks like the russet style, but that total look in general is, is very, pull very up, different. Pull up, I'll pull up a better picture. Hold on a second. Like I'll, I'll show you more something more advanced. Hold on. I got tons of pictures. I was telling uh, telling uh, Tara earlier today. I got lots of pictures of, of messed up plants just from working in. Yeah, little... those those ones were really cool, Steve. You need to post those on the Instagram. What was that nest one? <laughs> oh yeah. Nest. A bunch of them. That was weird looking. Hold on a second here. Let me find it. Hey, John. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Tonight in chat land out there. Hope you're all having a fantastic night. I need to take it out, by the way. How are you guys doing hanging out in the car? No hot boxing in the car. <laughs> we are. Uh... We're watching over a crop currently. There's been some uh, theft issues on our outdoor crop. So, yes, tell me about that. I want to hear about that. What's going on? We got, well, we got people out here robbing fields left and right. We're in a place called the Hemp Highway or the Cannabis Corridor in Reams Creek, Weaverville, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. And so we're in a farming community that has, you know, acres and acres of hemp everywhere. And we got some redneck punk ass kids and uh, apparently some basically grown ass men that are acting like kids out here robbing fields. And we've lost about a hundred plants in the last week. Oh man, sorry to hear that. That's so awful. You grow all year and then this stuff happens. You know, there's a medical patient in the chat tonight that's had his plants ripped off before at his house. It's just, I, I hate to see that. So okay, so this is it, Steve. So okay. Here's a here's a further advanced. See how it starts to clump up at the top, and then it just stops developing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's the same yeah. virus, just a different different cultivar. Yeah, that looks like a virus. <laughs> that has the look. <laughs> but, wow. There's a lot of weird shit that I'm starting to see this year that I just never saw before. Just, and I think it just has to do with shit being grown at scale, you know, at a di totally different scale. So, uh, what cultivars are you guys growing this year? Oh, yeah, that's some good stuff to talk about. Um, so we went heavy into the Oregon CBD strains. And so we've got Lifter, Suber, Hawaiian Haze, Sour Space Candy. That's what I went big on um, outdoor. Indoor, um, Jess been running. Been running uh, some cherry varieties, uh, therapy, a lot of the organ CBD genetics as well. Um, pretty much anything we can get our hands on, just kind of trial and see, see if we can find some, some gold in here out of all the, there's a lot of junk too. So we're just trying to weed out the trash and hopefully find some, some halfway stable genetics at this point to work with. Yeah, the, the Oregon CBD, we found three males and about 5,500 plants. Um, so we were happy with that. Uh, our genetics did flower a little earlier than we wanted them to, and we saw a lot of that across the Southeast, mostly with Oregon CBD genetics, especially with the sour space candy. Um, however, the fields are all over the place. The phenos are all over the place. There's not a lot of consistency other than they are really heavy bud producing strains. I mean, you might not see the same look up and down the rows, but you will definitely see a lot of bud and not a lot of leaf. And I'm, I'm definitely enjoying that about the, uh, the Oregon CBD strains. Um, I will definitely continue to be growing them. Um, I think it's necessary when we take them indoors to really try to isolate some moms that have some resistance and some good structure um, because I'm seeing a lot of different shapes and a lot of different problems and then some plants with no problems at all. So we're hoping to kind of weed through, if you will, some of the Oregon CBD genetics. Um, but uh, we're very happy with the overall weight, the overall look, um, the overall performance with them has been great. I would recommend them to other people. I do think they're worth the money. I don't think they're a ripoff at all. Um, so, can, can I, I, I have a question? Of, I, you yeah. said the three, you said you found three males? Only three males or you found three males you wanted to keep? I didn't. A feminized. No, no and, we, and all the feminized seed that we purchased or that we put oh. in this one planting, that we found three males. Perfect. Um, of, yeah, which we were very happy with that. We so, had a lot of different results with other with other genetics. So I was going to ask. So what do you when you're talking about the price? Because we're looking at this as we discussed before the show. So what are you? What is the pricing guidelines on, say, feminized seeds? I know what we've been buying them for. So what are you paying for them? And what about regulars? If you wanted to do biomass instead of worrying about smokable hemp? Well, we um, I've been purchasing a bunch of seed too. Um, so I've seen a bunch of uh, a different stuff. And you guys should get our buddy Thomas Orvec on here. He's a good seed uh, dealer here in North Carolina, but we're seeing about a dollar a seed for feminized cool. if you're purchasing, you know, a thousand or more. Yeah. Um, if you're purchasing bulk seed feminized, even feminized autos, we're getting down to like 60 and 50 cents a seed, which allows us to buy and resell some, which I've been happy with that. Um, and that's the other thing we did grow an autopilot um, I've been working with some of that. That those have been good. I think those are from HGH. Um, but yeah, the Oregon CBD strains. I, I'm really happy with them. Um, again, not necessarily because of uniformity, but they, I mean, they just they're all heavy bud producers. Yeah, great terp profiles too. Yeah, because I mean, I, the, before I got with the company, they bought like ten thousand seeds for um, for two dollars a piece, and they're all feminized too, and they're looking. Of course. They're looking good, but they're all outdoors so far, pretty much. We haven't got any. You know, it, down your way, though, Lee Ford. Um, you know, Lee? No, I don't know anybody in that industry right now. I'm, I'm waiting to go to our first big meeting. We haven't found a schedule on that yet. I'm trying to – my 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 partner's involved with the local associations and the state associations and is well-known there already. Um, yeah. 
And I was real happy about that because that means I won't be just the new guy that nobody knows when I get there. I've got, I've got background coming with me. So, well, you, you guys should reach out to Lee Ford. His, he's the son, I believe, of the Clemson football coach. He's one of the first guys to get a license. You mean Danny Ford? Out- yeah, he's Danny Ford's son. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. And so he's super outspoken. You guys got to get him on the show. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think you would you would you would enjoy him, but he told me he bought the Oregon CBD seeds last year, and he didn't like him at all. So I'm not trying to you know say that's the best. I just say this is my experience. That's what I've had with him. He said he didn't like him. I don't think. Well, you guys should get him on. He's a he knows a lot about the South Carolina scene. He's one of the first growers, and uh, he he um he he digs into the politics there because he's got the uh, connections. Oh, that'll be awesome to be a Danny Ford Sons part of the association that, that we get. Yeah, that, that'd be nice. Old, that's a long time ago, though, brother, when you said the Clemson coach's son. And I had to think, Ford, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, Danny Ford. That's that's who won the first <laughs> championship, not to get too far offline there. So so how do you incorporate uh, fish into your farm? So our fish are still on our nursery site. They're basically utilized for veg operations until we can really prove a mineralization technique and something that we can take to the commercial bloom side of things. So for right now, it's all in veg and all in nursery work. We're using all of our aquaponic water for feeding nursery stuff and cloning as well. Actually, we're having crazy good cloning uh, rates with it. Um, Not so much develop the budding and, and blooming techniques, which is something I'm hoping to still learn from you guys and uh, pick up some more techniques from, but um, we've had great success again with, with cloning and veg growth, and we're just looking to take that to larger scale. With more success we have, the more we can kind of put more capital into it. So we're not really farther along developed. Um, we're more just experiencing the same successes and are kind of betting on them a little more. Um, the one thing we did do in the last few months was go through USDA certification for organics. And so our field crops are not allowed to have the fish water on them. And we haven't gotten that process worked out yet. And so we're trying to operate and get our SOPs so that we can get a full aquaponic USDA stamp as well. But we're not quite there yet. So those can, are still kind of I can help isolated you with to that. our research. I can help you with that. I've written SO, uh, SOPs that it, for organic certified vegetable facilities. So if you need help with that, let me know. We can work together on that. Yeah, there's just a few challenges um, that I, I think that they're trying to get us to understand. And some of it has to do with the manure they consider of the fish and exposure to it. And, and those are things that we could definitely use some help on. But the next step since we've gotten the, uh, the full soil USDA certified is to get all the aquaponics and all of the container uh, also certified as well. Awesome, man. That's really cool. It's good I will say we got a lot of tilapia for sale if anybody's looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what uh, what cultivars do you think you're going to grow again next year from your batch, and which ones do you think are going to not grow? So um, right now, I don't like the sour space candy. It grows, unfortunately, too big, too dense. So I would like to take the sour space candy indoors for full, I mean, warehouse grow, not even for greenhouse. I think in the fields, I really did like the lifter. It grows heavy buds, but they seem more resistant than the other cultivars. And I really like Hawaiian haze. Hawaiian haze was a standout to me. Um, Great turf profile of all the, the plants in all the fields and all the greenhouses. The Hawaiian haze is by far my favorite. Um, Not the heaviest, the lifter is definitely the heaviest, but the Hawaiian haze has resistant qualities across multiple phenos from what I'm seeing and has a nose that, that is to die for. I mean, term qualities that I, I, that remind me of the super lemon haze that I uh, one time grew from Greenhouse Seed Company a uh, long, long time ago. It Dude, just that's that my really... favorite. That's my oh, favorite yeah. thing. Mine too. Oh my gosh. Yeah, oh, I fell wow. in love with that, that profile. 
And this Hawaiian haze had some reminiscence of that for me. And for that reason, um, it's my personal favorite. Not the heaviest, but the, the really beautiful and just the best nose that I've had on, on a strain in a while. Okay, so do you sell the seed? Or where do you get the seed out? Just say again. <laughs> you can only get this stuff directly from Oregon CBD. And they are releasing CBG strains. They also have an auto strain out. So the whole hype now in the hemp industry is where is, what's the next cannabinoid? So CBG, CBN, uh, THV, all that stuff. What's, so what's that's, the, that's what we're what's looking the, at. What's the highest stable CBG you've seen? Is the highest I've seen that's reputable with 6%. I, I personally haven't seen any. I've never grown any. And it's basically like a unicorn where I come from. And if I do just about anything to even get the 6%, Steve. So if you can help a brother out. <laughs> I, I might know a guy. I might know a guy. A guy um, offered me a cut and literally wanted $10,000 for the cut. And I just, I couldn't do it, man. So, uh, so, so speaking of which, um, uh, of education, uh, Marty, we got something coming up at your place. Do you want to tell people about that while we're. Oh yeah, sure. So on, uh, October, was it 17th to the 20th? Is that right, Steve? Yep. Um, we're going to do a four day commercial aquaponic class. Um, so a little bit longer version of our normal online class that we do. It's uh, aquaponics and cannabis. In this case, it's gonna be a little, little more in depth and focused on commercial solutions. Um, we're gonna talk about you know making our own nutrients, some of the stuff that we can't really get to in the two day class. Um, you, uh, this class will have an option to be on site here at my place in Gold Hill, Oregon. Uh, you can also do the online version, so we'll have cameras set up and, and live streaming it, so you can attend that way if you'd like. And uh, Steve has a huge slide deck. We're going to talk about lots of beneficial insect stuff. Um, we're going to talk about all of your different uh, um, considerations for, you know, I would say like cannabis 101 from A, uh, a to Z. Everything you need to do and that stuff so that I'll have, a, hit I'll, the have a, I'll have an all new section on viruses specifically in the IPM management section um, with lots of reference pictures. I've, I've seen a lot of different stuff that has been accurately identified uh, this particular year, especially working in Oklahoma. I've been doing a lot of consulting, just kind of cleaning up people's grows that are having issues. So um, uh, we got a lot of great reference pictures this year from a lot of different insects and a lot of stuff that just you know, are kind of hard to find pictures of. And if you haven't seen it before, you're like septoria. If you don't know what septoria is and to catch it early and you let that progress beyond a certain point, you're screwed. Um, like, like, and, and if you, and a lot of people, when they see septoria in particular, they think it's just, oh, well, the plant got wet and it, it got some magnifying light damage. Cause that's what it looks mm -hmm. like when it's off. in the very beginning, it looks almost identical to that. And then all of a sudden it's on, it starts progressing up the plant. And then over the course of a few days, and then, you know, you come back two weeks later and suddenly the leaves are rotting off. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that, you know, we'll have lots of reference material, but not only that reference material, but really early infection reference material as well, so that you know when it's just starting, um, and along with uh, uh, updated insect uh, guides based on what's been working in the field um, and uh, some other cool stuff. And then, um, uh, yeah, just some, some more... Um, some more work with, uh, uh, oh, looks like our guest is going to be, our other guest will be back in a second. We, oh, no, we lost two of them. Oh, no, we didn't. Okay, sorry. Everything's bouncing around on my screen here. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll have a bunch of more reference material, really big update to the class. Again, a whole new section on viruses specifically. So it's going to be really fun and um, it's going to be great. Uh, I should what was the able... date of that again, Marty and Steve? October 17th to the 20th. O October 17th to the 20th. And then what part of Oregon is that again? It's in Southern Oregon. So Southern Oregon. Okay. Just, uh, just north of Medford. So if you're looking to fly in, you can fly into the Medford Airport. It's about 20 minutes away. Um, or I'm right off I-5. If you're looking to drive, there's plenty of places here. 
in the Medford Central Point, Grants nice. Pass area that you guys can stay in. Um, so definitely accessible right on the I-5 corridor. And beautiful weather this time of year. It'll be so pretty there right now. Yeah, right now it's a, it's a little rainy, but I still like it. It's a to me, it's still still a great time. Um, but yeah, and before probably like before yesterday, it was really nice weather. It was like eighty five degrees and sunny. It was just it was great. But today it's definitely rain and fog. Uh, but to me, I, I like that too. So. So Especially, it's been really hot for a while, so it's been a nice change. You can find out more information on the class at apmjclass.com or commercialapmjclass.com. Uh, both of them will get you there. Cool. So, um, yeah, and it's a, a lot of fun. We give you a, a booklet that has all the different uh, slides on it, so you have everything in reference material. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then... Uh, um, it's, it's, uh, we also send out lots of files afterwards. You get digital files for reference from Twitter as well. And um, I know you'll, you'll, you'll get uh, all that if you purchase the class. And uh, yeah, it's a, again, a really, really good time. And um, we have people from all over the world that'll be joining us. And again, you don't have, if you can't make it in person, you can join us online. Again, Marty and I will have a whole array of cameras and microscopes that have cameras so that even if we're doing microscope work, I can show you online just the same as if you're peering through the glasses. Mm -hmm. We have a triscope and everything else set up so that you know you're not going to miss anything. It's not quite the same as you don't get the hands-on experience, but you know we will cover everything and every angle the same way as if you were there. So, alrighty. Um, uh, so um, uh, we'll uh, start to wrap things up here with uh, with Smoky Mountain. Uh, is there anything else you guys wanted to bring up, or any other topics you guys are? Are passionate about or, or uh, you know any other things that are kind of a big concern with your industry there you guys talked about um you know the the issues around the, the legality and then also with the the rippers um is there any other challenge in, in the past has there been, been other any other challenges you guys have had this year uh, before we let you guys go yeah you know, i think something worth mentioning um and i you know i might sound naive i'm sure you guys have seen this and it, it, it happens it's rampant in a lot of different industries so I know this isn't anything new, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Damn if everybody isn't screwing people over. Damn if people aren't ripping people off, not physically in the fields, but just business efforts. People are being shady. And there's a lot of like, from like people selling bunk seed, which we've read about lawsuits. There's a you know $20 million lawsuit in Colorado or in Washington, Oregon over that. Um, but in North Carolina and, and Tennessee and South Carolina and all these Southern places, man, there's a lot of bad stuff happening too. There's people taking advantage of people. And man, once again, the farmer's getting screwed, not only from the politician and then from the damn, the market in general sometimes because the retailers want to take the highest profit and buy at the lowest cost. And then it just seems like it's coming from every angle. And then all this money is flooding into here and people are ripping people off that way too. And not only that, we got calls from commodity brokers from all over the world. We got guys, I won't mention any names, but there are people implanted in the hemp community throughout the country, employed by commodities brokers, disguised as people's friends, disguised as people's walking around and being cool with people asking a lot of questions, showing up at every event. There's just weird stuff happening, man. And I don't, I don't know, man. I'm just a farmer trying to get by, but uh, I'm sure it's happening in the, in the general cannabis industry. But other than the stuff the farmer's always dealing with, like bugs and politicians, damn if the investment money and stuff isn't getting weird, too. So right, so, it's, so, it's, just, so it's weird. Two, two things on that. Uh, before I address the shadiness part, I had a very interesting uh, conversation with a gentleman who sat next to me on a plane when I was going out to go visit someone uh, this past weekend. And this guy does corn futures for, for cattle, for cattle feed. And he's freaking the fuck out because a lot of corn farmers that have been growing corn seed for, for cattle are switching to hemp. So yep. he's in like chaos. He's in total chaos mode 
because his he he's having a hard time trying to come up with real world numbers on what expectations for next year and the in the year after because everyone and their brothers is suddenly switching to hemp and 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 even people that have had agreements with him already are suddenly ending their agreements without you know on short notice and and it's going to affect beef prices pretty hardcore next year and people aren't ready for that but who would have thought that hemp legalization was going to affect beef prices you know like that that's a whole thing that like I haven't heard a single person talk about from the cannabis industry or any no, other industry. I have. Well, but can they just feed world. all these animals hemp? Well, we can absolutely feed them hemp for sure, but the, the byproducts, but at the same time, that's not something that they have commoditized and that they have with yeah. built in distribution networks and, and the same that they have with the corn and, and, and they, you know, there's no futures market yet. There's, you know, all these things that just come along with commodities that aren't there yet. Um, but they will be soon, but it's already affecting other crops, commodities, and futures markets. And that's something that, like, I certainly didn't expect to happen this quickly. And certainly not within year one of, of, of legalization of hemp for that to have such an impact that it's going to directly impact uh, the beef prices next year. Like, I never would have thought that, you know. Well, I think farmers are finally getting start uh, smarter and educated, and they're like, screw you all. I'm going to go after whatever's going to be best for my family and whatever's going to help our family That's out. These guys, are, these guys are getting bought over every day by big, huge corporations. I mean, the small guy can hardly make it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, nothing new either, okay. really. That's, that's no, it's, it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's really nothing new. You're right, Roger. We were just out talking to and visiting jo – I was just out visiting Josh Steensland's farm. And he's saying that a lot of these hemp growers are getting their entire farm out of debt in year one. Now tell me any other crop that you can get your entire farm's debt out of, your entire farm out of debt from previous year's crops and everything else in year one. That doesn't happen. And, and it's not going to last very long either. You know, yeah. and, and it's only going to last for one to three years, but, you know, longer than it, than it currently is before the bottom falls out. But as long as you chase the whatever the, the you know, can, uh, cannabinoid of the year is, um, you know, you'll at least do OK, at least for the next 10 years. I think. <laughs> I like that. Well, until cross pollination happens. Yeah, cross pollination. That's the next thing, too. That's going to take over. And we're going to we've already got too many dummies growing in this state and every other state and I'll put you indoors. yeah there's just yeah it's it's so dynamic it's hard to keep up yep and that doesn't even count malicious pollen release oh yeah well <laughs> yeah well that's why we're hanging out tonight watching the fields and watching the greenhouses yeah I, we think we could probably take you inside one of the greenhouses if you want to go yeah that'd be great um, while, while, while you guys are doing that, why don't we say hi to West Valley Seeds? Thanks for joining us. So. Sounds good. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time, man. I know you are uh, have quite the schedule. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty used to it these days, though, man. You know, the, the, the girls give me a lot of relief, both in being around them and, you know, the medicine they provide for me. So it's, it's very relaxing to spend my time around them. So why don't you give people a little bit of introduction about what you do and what you're about? Awesome. So uh, my name's Blake, or most people actually call me Gonzo. Um, and I've been growing medical cannabis now for about 12 years and working with a few other local Oregon breeders as far back as maybe six and a half years ago and uh, started making some seeds myself about four and a half years ago and then three years ago formed a a company called Magic Beans with my good friend Nick and uh, just only this week actually started West Valley Seeds to kind of take uh, things in the direction that I wanted to go with them in regards to line working some of my more you know, fav personal favorite cultivars and things like that. Very cool. So what are some of the cultivars that you're working with and what are what are kind of the traits that you're breeding for? Um, so I'm as much as I love flowers, I'm really just a, a huge dab head. And so the thing that I personally really breed for myself is how the finished product comes out in extract, whether that's a live resin or a live rosin. So I'm really essentially a turp hound. Um, I, uh, we, our, our first focus for the last three years, we really 
hunted down the elite cultivars that were as gassy as possible. And I have to give huge props to my friend Nick for doing a super fantastic job getting his hands on things that are otherwise seemingly impossible to get. Um, you know, so we're lucky enough to have things under stable like the verified Kim 91 Skunk VA cut, Triangle Kush, Kim 4, Kim Dog D. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's just been a, a true blessing to be able to work with those plants. Um, our first line of hybrids with most of those came out about a year and a half ago using a Starkiller OG male from a uh, rare dankness that we stress tested for a little over two and a half years before we actually put them to work pollinating any of the girls. And so uh, from there now I'm uh, initiated a, a, an F2 project. The first one we're doing is the pudding. And so that's the, the San Francisco burner cut Girl Scout cookies, which to me kind of differs fairly significantly from a lot of the other cookies cuts out there in that it's way more gassy than pretty much all the other cookies. It actually reminds me the most of the original sour diesel, not original diesel, but sour diesel more than anything else I've really ever had. So that, that's one of the, my personal favorites. And only recently in the last few months that we actually finally secure the real sour diesel cut. And so that's something we'll be working into the, the pudding line here very soon. I'm super excited about that. But we also got blessed with the dog walker OG cut and we made a hybrid called dire wolf with that. And that's been probably our, our single most phenomenal hybrid we've made so far. Um, we've just been really lucky in the sense that the worst phenotypes people get are something that's pretty close to being on par with the dog walker OG and the better phenotypes are just huge yielding, exceptionally loud, very resinous plants. Nice. Um, now, uh, let me pop in for a second. Do uh, um, you want to tell us about what's going on over there, Smoky Mountain? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Yeah. So we're in um, room uh, one in the Nexus greenhouse. So we just got this room online like a week and a half ago. And I had, you know, transplants that were ready to go in, you know, been, been ready. So we've got about between five and 600 plants in here, um, all Oregon CBD strains. We're in a 42 by 96 room. Uh, we've got about 32 double enders in here. And we are, uh, we're in 10 gallon pots with certified organic media from Roots Organics. We're running their green fields plus a custom uh, blend we add to it. And these are the plants that will get split up to go into the next room. I can kind of walk you over, I think. We just transplanted here last week. The plants in the back were from my nursery. Those are gonna get transplanted. Here's some controls you can see. And then I think if the lighting's right, we can see in room two. So this is Nexus room two, the light depth's on in here. We don't have plants in, but this is the next uh, the next room we're about to turn on. We've got uh, stacks of green fields here. We've got stacks of you know, phantom double enders about to go back up. And we're gonna put our, our white ground cloth down. So the Nexus will be up running in full capacity here, um, not too long. And then we'll split these plants out into the two rooms and then we have a third greenhouse outside of the nexus facility um, that is an older facility that we run for veg as well and we will uh, fill that room up as well and so in another 90 days from now we'll probably have another harvest of another 600 plants indoor and our veg facility will also be running a number of autos so uh We'll check in in a few months and give you guys some updates, but the Nexus facility is basically up and running. We'll be cutting the three acres in about three weeks, and uh, that's kind of an overlook of what we got going on. How many plants are in there? Man, I think there's like 540. And what's the size of that? Because I've got a Nexus, but my walls aren't that high, but I'm just curious. This, is, this room uh, is 96 by 42. And the side okay, walls are got, 14 feet. I got a 96 by 30. So, But again, I'm not going to grow this total number in this one room. I'm going to split that into the two rooms. And whatever uh, doesn't fit will go into uh, the third greenhouse. 
and I basically run, you see, I've got four rows of lights. I'll run a set of two plants on either so side, but I'll just make the spacing uh, not so tight. And then we'll lay down our regular drip irrigation for plain water. And then we'll hand feed all of our teas and of our custom blends that we do in the tanks. Cool. What is your, uh, what is your expected yield per plant? Um, you know, the, this is actually still Oregon CBD seed, not clone. So I'm, I'm kind of getting different growth out of that. So I'm not sure what I'm going to see in this, but I, I'm seeing over in the third greenhouse, right around a half pound of actual bud per plant if I grow them out to full capacity. Again, there'll be biomass left over here, but the stuff that's indoors here is grown for smokable flour as long as, um, as long as it's legal here. I mean, some of the plants we have next door are probably up to a pound of, of bud a plant. But no, again, no, once we space these out and trellis them and, and, uh, and defoliate, I'm not sure yet. We haven't really grown in this room yet. And these genetics are still new to us. We will eventually switch to their clones once we isolate the mothers and get the right ones so we have a little more consistency. But we uh, right now, this is still seed that we had from spring. Uh, will you see? Will you switch to seed production or something if they make smokable flour illegal, or will you just switch to to oil? No, we uh we North Carolina. It doesn't matter. We have products in fifty states, um, or at least through distribution companies that reach that many states, and so we can uh we can sell to other states. It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, we there's plenty of markets and avenues to uh to do that, and uh, we'll take our business elsewhere if the state doesn't want our money. We still have plenty of extraction to do here and oil to make, but um, the smokable flower market is alive and well and doesn't have to be here for us to go make that money. Can, can you address, uh, you mentioned uh, your biomass, so you're going to move that to a processing plant or something for fiber. What's the market value of biomass there in Carolina now? Um, well, our biomass is for extraction for oils. Oh, okay. So, you get rid of it. Okay. Um, you know, What's that biomass price? could be Prices for that are all over the price too. Some are as low as twenty a pound. Ours is USDA certified organic, so um, we're we're not selling our biomass. We are going to be extracting it ourselves. Okay, cool. So we're trying to vertically integrate, and that's what's going to allow us to kind of survive the oncoming crash that other farmers will not be able to to make it through. I don't think there's going to be the crash that everyone thinks there is, and I I know I sound like a crazy person for saying that. But hear me out. I've gone and I've seen 40 plus farms in Oklahoma, okay, that are hemp or cannabis. I'm going to tell you right now about 70% of those are not going to pass state testing. They're all infected with septoria or, or fusarium or powdery mildew. Uh, it, it's just... Maybe if you're doing isolate and you're going direct to isolate and you can get around your state's testing board, sure. But if you can't do that, I just, I don't, the skill level of, of growing that crop isn't there. It just isn't. That's right. That's exactly what's going on. You got so many corn farmers that think they're just going to plant and grow it out in the field. Like we keep talking about this, but it's the same thing over and over. It's just so much inexperience trying to jump in and make it straighter. I mean, I went, I went to a grow that had spent almost $2 million and they didn't know the plants had to go to 12-12 in flower. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not <laughs> joking when I say that. That's legit something I saw in person. That's brutal. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but this is people with more money than sense. Okay, yeah, there's so a lot of that. Point this out what this is right here. This is really important. A lot of people don't get to see this on these greenhouses. Yeah, I thought that's that's be a reason to Thank show you. it. So this room right here, it's if you can see this, this is a fine mesh screen that screened down to thrip. And that's the room that we enter here. And so all the air coming into our evaporative cooling wall first goes through insect screening. And so we kind of screen all of our air. And here, that's also where all of our electrical is. 
and you can see we've got a pretty high ceiling up in here. I can probably take you guys out to the field. I'll tell you what, I'll join you in just a second. Sure. Sorry to cut you off there, West Valley. Um, so uh, so um, tell us more about uh, the different, um, uh, so what do you look for in a male when you're looking for breeding? Because you're talking about doing a lot of breeding. What, what are some of the traits you look for specifically in males? So I, I kind of have developed my own technique over the last four or five years of looking for males. Uh, and I kind of do it in a way I feel reversed from a lot of other breeders. So I, I try to pop as large a populations as I can afford to, whether it's on resources, space, or time, or whatever. And usually I, I pop around 100 seeds per uh, cultivar per strain, again, depending on the constraints I have. And the first thing I usually do when I start sexing the plants is cull, cull males that have undesirable traits right out the gate. Things that are too lanky, have too big of internodal spacing, things that are runs, things that have undesirable stem rubs or things that don't have any smell on the stem rub. And that usually will take me from, let's say, a population of 50 males, sometimes down to as few as six or seven, just culling, 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 getting rid of stuff that just isn't appealing for what I'm looking for. Um, and then the current process has typically been to keep them around for several months in a rather small pot to stress them out, let them get root bound, not feed them very adequately, kind of put them off to the side of the room and not give them proper light and just generally kind of stress them out a little bit to see who might respond poorly, to see if it triggers any intersex traits, to see if somebody's going to drop pollen before anybody else. And after a couple of months of that, I usually start to get a feel for the, you know, the, the five, six, seven that are left. And I'll usually take a clone. And from there, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you need to flower your males. And well, that's a great way to go about it. I found that it, it still doesn't tell you enough. You can only really know how successful pollination was by testing the resulting seeds. So I usually, once I've cooled down to the last five or six, I'll make a determination based on the terpene profile of the stem rub and move forward from there. And I know it's not very scientific or technical and pretty old school, but it's it's been really successful for us so far to this point. Love old school. Yeah, and so that's that's kind of the main thing now but that's also been because everything that we've done up to this point is really focused around the terpene profile and so in the end that stem rub is the thing that really drives us to choose the boys now with some of the future projects we have going on one of the things that we're going to be doing is uh, we have a hindu kush male that was chosen for both this terpene profile and his early flower in induction in the the northwest environment because we're actually going to be trying to do a lot more focusing on seeds for production for larger scale outdoor growers and stuff like that, as well as home growers who might only have the opportunity to grow their four plants outside in a less than desirable environment. So we're going to be using a Hindu Kush male and doing some stuff with that that seems to be exceptionally resilient to the Northwest environment. And then we also have some Northwest cultivars that have been selected over the last 25 years that we've collected. Things like the, the Willie's Wonder, the UW hash plant, uh, the Obama Kush, uh, you know, and some of them obviously more recent like the Obama. And those are gonna be going into a feminized hybrid project so that we can kind of open up some of those genetics and give people the opportunity to grow their four plants worry-free and know they're gonna get something that's gonna finish with nice resistance in this environment. That's really interesting. Um, it, it, it's always cool to hear people's different opinions on, on how to choose males. Um, is there any particular interesting traits that you've discovered in, in some of the males you've worked with over the years? Um, you know, the, the real surprising thing is when you make a combination of two plants and the progeny with a high frequency just seem to have no apparent relationship to either of the parents. Um, I've only personally seen this a couple of times in our own work, but one of the examples of this is one of the cuts that we cherish the most out of our own breeding work is something we call alien marmalade. And it's a hybrid of Grateful Puff from Gage Green and Wi-Fi Alien OG from uh, OG Rascal. And on a whim, we made a pollination, I think three years ago, outside with two really small paltry plants. I think we got 10 seeds and seven of them became plants. And in the end, we ended up with a couple of girls we really liked, but we called them alien marmalade because there's not a lot of similarity to either of the parents, but there's a very distinct orange rind profile to every single one of the offspring. All six of the girls that came out of those seven seeds 
were just exceptionally citrusy in the same general region of, of being orangey too. And so that, to me, that's typically the most interesting is when you get something that just seems to be greater than the sum of its parts. We have a second one that's very similar story, our coveted pudding 12 cut. And so the pudding is our Burner Girl Scout cookies, the Starkiller OG. We pollinated that with uh, some pollen from a creme brulee from Bay Exclusive Seeds. And instead of getting a really cookie OG dominant variety that came out of that, the one seed that actually made it, because I think we had five, was another one-off project. The one seed that made it has papaya, guava, and orange terpenes, is the biggest plant in the greenhouse at 14 feet from a clone, two months younger than the rest of the plants in the greenhouse, and also throws pink pistols and finishes with some of the most gorgeous, col gorgeous colors I've ever seen. That's so awesome. really, I guess in the end, it's it's unlocking recesses is kind of my 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 favorite part of this. One of the uh, my my favorites, and I never personally experienced this, but uh, the uh, jackpot royale hybrid from Alpha Chronic from about five or six years ago. There's a really rare like red or pink hued pheno where the flowers just they look like they're being grown under blur for LEDs, even under like CMH. It's amazing. Wow, you have me super interested. The turp profiles sound amazing on all these things. <laughs> that's that's our specialty. We really, oh. the terpenes are what we're after here. And so, you know, like the, the UW hash plant that we're actually going to be using as our most likely either our first or second ever uh, feminized pollen donor, she has a, a, a specific, I wouldn't call it grape, but a purple note to her up front followed by very floral incense tones that finish kind of with a, your, your classic, you know, dry sift hash notes. And she's just an amazing plant. And the, those terpenes I feel would complement so very well some of the other very floral, fast flowering outdoor varieties we have here in the Northwest. So, you know, and, and putting, combining those and opening them up and seeing what kind of possibilities there are, that's really one of my favorite things ever in life. Awesome. I'm going to jump back to Brooke just for a second because he's showing us some pretty sexy plants here. Um, <laughs> uh, what, hey man, so we're we're out here in the three acres where the where the ripoff artists apparently come. Just cruise through and show you some of these buds. I mean, they're they're big. They're they they got a lot of weight on them. I mean, some of these girls are, and you got to think I didn't plant until. July 8th through the 16th. Wow. So how tall are they, would you say, average? Or Go stand next to that Jeff with a light on it. Yeah, get over there and stand next to that. <laughs> I mean, Jeff is <laughs> Jeff's six feet tall. Okay. So they're four, yes. at least four and a half. They're four and a half, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've got, uh, I mean, they've, they've got a lot of weight on them. We've got our bees over here. Have you see our bee boxes? Oh yeah, I don't want to get stung, but there. Oh, is. that's cool, man! You got your own bees. That's awesome. Oh yeah, they're piled up. You're my hero now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of pollination, obviously, in my field, but I just love bees. <laughs> well, I'm allergic to bees, but I need them, so you know. So. so yeah, guys, um, we're out here in the moonlight, enjoying it, and uh, these crops are coming down in about three weeks. <laughs> I appreciate you guys having us on tonight. Jeff and I really had a good time. Do you guys have any issues with those floodlights with the plants at all? Well, our light depth systems are being put in, and so we can hopefully be able to turn those off soon. Uh, the light depth's only on in the other room. But we haven't had any issues so far. Everything's been so wanting to bud so hard. And honestly, these things wanted to flower almost under 18 hours of light. And you're, you, it looks like you're running plastic mulch there too, eh? Yeah, we've got plastic culture down here. Now, do you have drip tape underneath that? Do you have I drip tape? Double drip, one here, and then one. Yeah, yeah. Right okay. there. One on each side. All right. Yeah. But you want to know something crazy? I've never used it. Really? That's an awesome system, man, that fertigation. If you well, we've got it all set up, but it's, been, it's such a wet season. Yeah. There's so much water that I see a lot of guys getting problems from trying to irrigate on top of all this rain. So we just let these plants do what they did and let the soil do what it does best and just let it go to work. 
Well, it'll be good if it if you get a drought time, a little tiny drought or something. But they oh, yeah, also yeah. taught me when I learned my hydroponics from my guy in South Africa. He told me that in a rainy time, because all they do is put up poles and then put up a, a, a shade cloth. So yeah. I said, yeah, but what about when it rains? He goes, we increase the nutrient solution parts per million by 10 to 15 percent. You know, so. You know, with the with the rain again, yeah, I understand you. Yeah, you can if they're looking good natural. There's nothing, no reason to do anything different. Yeah, yeah we're we got the next two weeks look like nothing but sunshine and beautiful weather. So we're hoping this next dry spell and heat spell finishes them off real good. If we get a chance to feed a little bit of something, we might. But these girls look good. We're really happy with them, and I think they're going to make just wonderful oil. So. Uh, We'll be excited to report back after harvest and let you know how it yields and uh, and how the oil comes out. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Why don't you tell everybody how to, uh, how to learn more about your farm and uh, how to get your products? Oh, yeah. Um, check us out. Um, we're all over Instagram at Smoky Mountain Medicinals. Um, our new company is Phyto Fox. You can check us out online. Um, my supply company's Lotus Farm and Garden. You can check them out. And basically, Google or check us out through the internet. You'll find us. And uh, we look forward to you know connecting with everybody out there and hopefully getting back on the show with you, Steve, and and seeing everybody again. We really appreciate it. We want to get down to South Carolina and hang out with you too, man. Well, I was just getting. I was waiting for you to give me a second uh, opening there, and I was going to say, yeah, don't. Don't be surprised if you if you got visitors here in the next two or three weeks. I'm telling you, buddy, we're ready to go. And and I've been yeah, bragging about just your, let me know when you want to come up. You're welcome any day of the week. We're here every day. All right. I've been bragging about your farm to people around here for months. So, you know. Well, come on up and get a t shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll exchange t shirts. <laughs> I'm coming to get some of them sweet seeds you got, you know. <laughs> well, thanks again, guys. It's been a real pleasure. And uh Love you, brother. We meet you guys all in person soon. Yep. Thank you. Okay, good night. Take care. All righty. Uh, thanks a lot for 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 him for joining us. Uh, they're all they've been on the show before, and he's always good to have him on. You can check him out yeah, too. Yeah. Thanks for the freaking tour of the greenhouse. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah I agreed. I was. That was nice. So, Very good looking plants. <laughs> Damn so, good looking uh, greenhouses. Yeah. So West Valley, what are some other traits uh, as far as female plants aside from just testing and and just smokeability that you're looking for? I know there's always different things that maybe are, are things that people don't think about or, or things that are just favorable over other traits. What what do you go after? If you're a you said you're into uh, more of a concentrates, so do you, you, I would imagine you're going after larger trichome size varietals. Cause, you know, that's a trade I would love to get into breeding for at some point, but my feeling on this process, if it's going to be my life's work, which I really feel it will end up being is, is that in order to have the foundation to pursue further traits, I really have to focus on breeding for, for one thing first until I've stabilized the traits that I'm looking for in multiple filial generations, you know, potentially anywhere from seven to 15 filial generations to get those, you know, terpene traits really stabilized the way I want them, which means that even though I have so many amazing cultivars, I really have to narrow it down to maybe five or six hybrids to line work for the next five or six years. And once the terpenes are locked into a point where they're very stable, then I feel like I can start being like, all right, let's find some hash plants that increase the, the actual production on these things. But for now, I'm really truly just focused on finding the terpene profiles that have the best effect for me and the, the people around me that I have as patients. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, and we and when we do selection, you know, so we did a, a good example of this is um, we just did a, a a moderate pheno hunt of our the Magic OG hybrid that we made as Magic Beans with Nick, and that's the ninety two OG Kush cut we crossed to the Star Killer OG male we have, and twenty phenotypes, every single one of them was at least slightly different. Out of those twenty. There was one that's a throwback to one of the parental lines, which I would say might be the red Afghani. I don't know if you've ever heard of that cut. It's something that I was exposed to when I grew for uh, motorcycle clubs here here in the uh, Portland area back when. And uh, it's a very unique, very incense very kind of unpleasant taste, but has a, a ridiculous effect. And so out of those 20 plants, we got one of those that 
has nothing to do with OG Kush, where the other 19 are essentially some form of either SFV triangle Kush or OG Kush or a mix of any of the three. And so when, we, when we're going through these to, to find the, the keepers beyond just the terpenes as we're smoking these flowers, we're always also looking for the, the, the most effect. That's, that's the other thing that I really associate to me with the terpene profile is which one of these is the, the best medicine for what the strain, in, at least in general, seems to be good for. Are you on Instagram? Yep, we're at West Valley Seeds, and my uh, my friend Nick is at Magic Beans. He was, okay. I, I can't give him enough props for helping establish and you know collecting a lot of the clones and stuff we use. So, but yeah, and we're we're all over Instagram. Grower below yours. Yep. Okay, cool. I, I'm gonna put a screen share up here. Hopefully, let me try and get one up here so we can show some pics off there. Awesome. Thank you. Meanwhile, yeah, we have really low bandwidth because I missed your introduction. Are you giving out your name? I didn't get yeah. it. Yeah. My name's Blake. Most people call me Gonzo from, you know, my, my 20s or whatever. But yeah, I'm, I'm Blake. It's nice to meet you, man. No, I'm Roger. Yeah, Th thanks. I, I don't know how I missed that, but I did have to leave for, I don't know if you came in while I was gone. Or it's whatever. very possible. No problem. All right. Well, welcome to our show while we're waiting on Tara to put us a beautiful picture. Thank you. Yeah. And so this year, the, the greenhouse is, is just medicine production for, for me and the family and stuff. Um, but it, it's really important for us because we like to focus with the indoor work we do on seed production and pheno hunting and furthering the lines that we have. And so being able to produce the majority of the medicine we need for the year under the sun, you know, both cost effectively and very environmentally friendly is something that, that we really enjoy doing. And hopefully here soon we'll be able to retrofit into some LEDs and get away from these HID lights that we've been using for so long and be, be even a little bit better as far as the environment goes. It's kind of hard, huh? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, everything. Definitely. Yeah, we're going through that over here too. I'm trying, but just, just, there just never seems to be enough money to do it all totally at once. Yeah. Oh no, I, I certainly understand. It's all about incremental growth in this business. And whether you're, you're doing seeds or growing hemp or a large scale recreational farm, it's all about incremental growth. Okay, are we seeing it now? Yep, that's me. Okay, it popped here up we in go. my yeah. So I'm going to click on some of these so we can look at some nice pictures. Here you go. Go ahead and I'll let you talk. And if you want me to pick on one, just tell me what you want. All right. So that is a, that's a, a fresh batch of pheno hunting we're doing. That's a, a, a new phenotype of the pudding hybrid. We have the burner Girl Scout cookies, the star killer OG. Um, I'm a, the, the pudding is my personal, like it's my, it's my love child. It's the one that when I decided that I was going to breed and especially use this particular star killer OG male, that was the only cross that I really had in my heart that no matter what I was going to make. Um, and it's, it, to me, it's really cliche and cheesy because it's a, a, you know, a cannabis cup winning strain, the star killer OG and girl scout cookies. It's really kind of stuff that is in a lot of ways, especially with the circles I run. And it's kind of taboo stuff. It's not a, it's kind of frowned upon to work with that gear, but the simple fact is, is that the effects from both of those plants are exactly what works for me and it works for a lot of our patients. And so that's, that's why we love it. Um, the pudding especially isn't necessarily the best producer given the genetic makeup it has, but it, it really packs the punch that we need to, to find the comfort and relief from the plant. So, and so uh, let's see, that's the, the cookie duster number five. Oh no, that's actually a, more of the pudding there, another phenotype of pudding. And so it's an especially resinous plant. Um, we have a cut now, the number 12 cut. It is a, uh, it's kind of it's kind of hard to describe. It has a, a slight hint of doughiness, coupled with a mild hint of grape, all covered in a whole lot of race fuel kind of gas. It's it's also a very good performer compared to a lot of the perennial lineage. Um, we're able to see in indoor grows, you know, pretty easy two pounds a lot with that cultivar compared to other plants that in the same setting might might hit a maximum of two and a half. So it's a pretty good producer. Um, let's see here. What do we got? Ah, oh, the video. Yeah, so the video there. That's a the the plant in that video is the alien marmalade bee that we have, and that's one I was talking about earlier. That's the orange. So that that particular plant is actually potentially the our best creation to date. It's very resistant to PM and molds and stuff like that. Unfortunately, the two spot spider mites do have a penchant for it, but with little helpers in the garden like that spider, it's not the biggest deal. But it yields exceptionally well. Um, as far as hash production with that one, it's one of the few we've been blessed enough to have extracted recently. And then live resin, it produced 6%. That's 50% more 
production than the average strain in live resin. So that, that plant's been just phenomenal for us. We also have one very large one of her in the greenhouse. Um, key lime pie, if any of you have had the pleasure of experiencing that, it's not necessarily the most apt name for the terpenes of the, the strain, but it is a sweet, candied, slightly citrus, wonderful, I would, I guess, describe it as a feminine cannabis experience. It has kind of a floral sweet essence to it that's very perfume on a spring day like. It's just, it's, it's probably the, the best extract I've ever had that I didn't personally produce. So that, that one's one that we're, we're massively in love with. Uh, that very frosty picture down there in the center. That, that is, have. yeah, that is our peanut butter patties. So that is Dosi Do cross to uh, 22B, which is an OG Kush Breath back cross one from, again, from Bay Exclusive Seeds. They have some really awesome rare genetics, and we've, we've been really blessed to be able to find some of their seeds and find some gems to work with out of there. Um, this is actually a project that the, uh, the other workers here on the farm, they're actually prepping a soil as we speak. We have 100 of those peanut butter patty seeds that we're going to be planting tonight for the next pheno hunt and uh, making F2 progeny. That there is the cookie duster number five again. So that's the papaya, guava, and orange terpene hybrid of Pudding 12 and Creme Brulee from Bay Exclusives. Um, it's another one of the really lucky one-offs that we made, just a phenomenal plant. And then of course, GMO. Uh, there's a reason that it's been such a, a standout hit with everybody for the last couple of years since it came on the scene. It's, I, I personally find it more appealing than the, the Kim Dog D, that's the mother plant, um, in the sense that the, the terpene profile is even more disgusting going on there. Yeah, I can't get enough of that key lime pie. I'm pretty obsessed with her. And she was a very late plant into the greenhouse. She got into her 200 gallon pot, I think, the first week of July and was able to catch up with other plants that were planted mid and late May that were also significantly larger than her when they were planted. But, you know, this goes back to some of the stuff that you guys were talking about earlier on the, the podcast. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of difficulties these days in regards to having clean, healthy genetics that are free from things like viruses, which is definitely new to a lot of people who've been growing cannabis for a long time, but a very real problem. So in the past years, we've definitely had potential issues with things like fusarium and stuff like this in this greenhouse. And then we've also even had indoor issues with whatever, you know, people say is the dudding. So these are uh, some shots of some live resin that we're really proud of. This material was grown in the greenhouse last year and actually it stayed frozen for approximately nine months before it was processed and still came out just exquisite like it was still super fresh. So we've been super lucky and uh, base of Fremo Extracts has been blessing us with, with his hard works and efforts to make all of that gorgeous extract possible. Dude, that just smelled me up. Made me, blew, I can't even talk. It made my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing all them turps being poured in there. Yeah, look at all that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in, in those jars, we have a total of three different uh, blends. One of them is pure alien marmalade B. So that's the, the orange creamsicle turps and, and Kush Funk. Then we have a, a blend of Kim 4 and, and a Dog Walker OG. And the Kim 4 is the mother of the Dog Walker OG. So it's really pretty Kim 4 dominant kind of terpene profile, but there's still a nice little hint that comes from the Albert Walker side of the Dog Walker OG on the back end of it. And then the other, the third and final one there is the, the Pudding 12, which is our beloved cut of the, the, the Girl Scout cookie hybrid that we grow. Any samples tonight with us? No, I'm joking. Not yet, not yet. I we wish. Work on making that happen though. We have another batch on the way, so. Uh, I, I went through it pretty hardcore myself, but we can we can definitely share the love, so. Oh, it looks amazing. And so that really tall plant in the right hand there. That one there? Yeah. Yep. That is a, a full-size picture of the cookie duster number five. And that was about, well, yeah, two weeks ago. So she's put on another two feet or so approximately. She's just about a foot shy of the, the, the peak of the 16-foot greenhouse there. And so our, uh, our growing methods, so unfortunately at this point, we haven't actually gotten any aquaponics set up, but we do still grow with a lot of fish. We actually use fish hydraulic slate as the main input we use in our soil. We typically feed about once a week and brew a tea or about every two weeks or so. Very cool. Yeah, and hopefully we have, we have several greenhouses that still aren't functioning here. 
And actually, the main function of the farm is a um, vegetable start production for local grocery stores. And we really, really, really would like to, to see us growing some tilapia and integrating some aquaponics by next spring. That would be awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely a goal of ours. So you're looking at you're looking at um, so you're looking at tilapia, huh? Because a lot of people have mixed emotions about it. I mean, it's the easiest one to use, but yeah, I you know, um, it's I haven't studied aquaponics nearly as much as I should have at the point that I'm at right now in, in my growing life. But uh, the tilapia is definitely what I've heard people having success with in my general area. I know that they have good resistance to the environment we have, and so I'm very interested in going that route. As long yeah. as you have a market. As long as you have a market to buy it, really, that's the biggest thing. Well, our thought actually is, you know, currently we buy a fish hydrolyslate from another company. We're not opposed to actually starting our own fish hydrolyslate and, and turning the end product into that. Cool. <clears throat> cut, your, cut your fillets and then use the rest. Right? Yep. And when you said Portland, you're talking Oregon, right? Yes, sir. So we're... We're southeast of Portland, between Oregon City and Estacada, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, uh, just we like it here. My wife's from West Valley, New York, and I just wanted to clarify for sure you weren't up in Portland, Maine, or something like that. No, sir. Nope. We're just we're in the West, and we're in a valley, so that was the new name. It wasn't very creative, but it works. All right. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to, Tara beat me to it, but when she took over the screen with a screen share, I didn't realize my mic was on, because I was going to say, yeah, how about some of them samples? So we're on the same, but we're on the same page there for sure. You know, there's some nice stuff there. Oh, here's a nice call. There we go. Look at that. Yeah. So that is uh, the magic OG that we were talking about earlier. That is, uh, I believe at harvest day, that's the phenotype number nine. Um, she actually ended up not making the cut. She was the biggest yielder out of the batch, but her terpene profile just, just wasn't on point with a lot of her sisters. She had a really nice, very triangle cush and I'd say like linoleum glue kind of nose for her, but the potency <laughs> overall just wasn't there. So she didn't, she didn't make it through the revenge phase. Oh, so you're, what are you doing? You're doing this and testing, then you're revenging them to take your clones? Um, in this particular situation, that's how we did it. Uh, the revege isn't my favorite thing just because it's kind of space right. cons and time consuming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Typically I usually, I like to bank my clones uh, when, when the plants are about eight weeks old or so. So I try and top them around four weeks. And then I usually try and clone them around eight weeks and flower them another week or two after that once they've recovered well from the right. nurturing of the cloning. But we really try to always make sure we take the clones from, from the top of the plant and the healthiest shoots to ensure the, the most vigorous possible. So everybody knows about OG Kush. These pictures that are up right now are of the Magic OG, which is really a, a very inbred line to the OG Kush. So Starkiller OG is a hybrid of Skywalker OG, Triangle Kush, Ghost OG, Triangle Kush, and Kim Dog. Uh, and don't ask us where the Kim Dog in there comes from, if it's the original pollen donor, because we know it's a clone only. And, you know, it's, it's one of Scott Reach from Eridinkus's plants. And so we, we kind of verify exactly where that came from, but that's the lineage. And so the Triangle Kush is the direct sister, allegedly, I mean, this is, I haven't verified this via genetic test yet, but is the direct sister allegedly of the 92 no cross OG Kush we use as the mother plant of the magic OG. And so with the ghost OG, which is just the 92 no cross OG being in there once already and the triangle Kush being in there twice, this is essentially a very OG Kush intensive family line run of seeds. And like I was saying earlier, out of 20 seeds, 19 of them were either SFB triangle Kush 92 OG or some combination thereof as far as the terpene profiles go, which for me has been heaven on earth because I can't get enough of OG. So <laughs> but right now I think our, our phenotype number three is the winner and we'll be going on to make F2s here in the very near future with our selected male. Awesome, see, I see you got some gummy bears there too. Huh? That, you doing that yourself? Yeah, we, we make distillate candies for some of our patients. Um, I uh, sometimes even if I run an RSO, I'll take some of those candies with me to dialysis and eat them while I'm sitting in the chair to, to kind of stay level headed, you know, they're, they're nice and effective. It's really easy to dose them out really small, especially for people that don't have very high tolerances. I personally eat usually between one and three grams of RSO a day. So a 10 milligram 
candy doesn't really do anything for me, but they're, they're nice to have as a backup. Also, did you get into this because you have cancer or, you know, or. No, actually I originally got into doing this because of a uh, cancer in the family. Um, and then to be honest, I mean, my, my very first memory from childhood is actually carrying a small bucket of water up to my, my dad's gorilla grow, grow out in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere. So it's, it's been my, it's been my life as long as I can remember. I was actually really opposed to it in my teenage years because of the example set by a lot of the people around me. But I had some, some good friends who didn't, they, they weren't bad people. They didn't suck at life. They had good jobs and, and were, you know, as, as young men in, in their early twenties, they, they did good. And they used a lot of cannabis and they talked me into trying it one day. And uh, unfortunately that day went really bad for me overall. And, and I uh, didn't smoke again for another year after that, but it's, it's definitely overall made me a better person. It's enabled me to connect a lot more with, uh, the people close to me, my family members, especially it's built a bond between me and my brother that I don't think would have ever existed had we not had cannabis in our lives. And so it's, it's extremely special to me. I might in the, in the future pursue other avenues as my main career and income goal, but I'll, I'll always be breeding cannabis. It's just, it's done too much for me to not try and do what I can to proliferate it and further it myself. That's awesome. See how some of the smartest people we know are, are cannabis growers, you know, and well diverse, intelligent people uh, tend to be I, I, you know, cannabis growers. You know, I run across more and more people that blow me away with how much they know across the whole spectrum of knowledge and life and everything. You know, so that's interesting. You've got a background with the family and all, too. So. Yeah. Well, we've actually, you know, we've had a, a pretty good success over the years with treating cancer as medical growers. Um, unfortunately, we've also lost uh, a, a number of patients and uh, more often than not, it seems that the stuff that we can't effectively treat is uh, glioblastomas as brain tumors. We've lost four, four close friends to glioblastomas over the last 12 years, but we've been able to successfully treat a lot of other kinds of internal cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, uh, skin cancers of all sorts. Um, and we're definitely treating my, my own, so my own health stuff is very recent. It's a, I have kidney and heart failure. And it's, it's a little, a little staggering at the age of 35, but uh, I've definitely upped my RSO dosage very significantly since, since that diagnosis was passed down. And I, I feel like I'm regaining some kidney function and stuff because of it. And I, I definitely have a lot further to go in regards to my own diet. And I should really be inspired by the organic diet that we feed the plants to, to take better care of myself. It's really hypocritical of me to go through such great lengths to make sure that I'm feeding the purest, most organic things I can to my plants and then poisoning myself with processed food. So that's exactly it. I'm learning so much from growing cannabis. It's teaching me so much and making me grow in so many ways learning that. I mean, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Absolutely. And yeah. then, you know, like I was saying earlier, the main function of this farm is actually to produce organic vegetable starts for local grocery stores. And so uh, it's something that we, we've actually tried to be as closed looped as possible. So the majority of the nutrients we use in the cannabis garden come from places like down by the river. We are able to harvest a lot of horsetail. We compost a lot of the blackberries that grow so evasively and aggressively on the property. Um, yeah. you know, we can to, to have as many pollinator gardens around the, the property as possible. We had a, a 16th of an acre of indigenous wildflowers on the intake side of the greenhouse this year for pollinator support. Um, you know, we, we try to be good stewards to the land and it's something that, uh, it's just super important because if, if you're leaving behind a heavy footprint while you're trying to produce this medicine, it, it's very counterintuitive, you know? So try, trying to do everything we can to raise the bar and, and set an example to be better stewards of the land and our bodies and everything. Exactly. Which is really hard. <laughs> well, there's so much, you know, it's kind of funny, but there's so much judgment in that these days, too. If you get in, involved in this in a commercial way, people are expecting you to leave a, a, a leave, leave, leave the land better than you got when it was what it was. With, bleh, there, I think my tongue just went numb, too, Tara. Um, <laughs> there wasn't even um, any turfs on the screen. Just kidding. <laughs> I, just, I, just up some good Ooh, I see some mushies, though. <laughs> yeah, so that's just... Uh, in mycology that exploded out of the, the local com equine based compost that we sourced this year for reamending the soil. So the, those pots are actually on their third or fourth year of being recycled living soil. Nice. Um, yeah, we, we definitely reached out and re-inoculated with some, some good local compost this year. We also took the, the Cress's soil 
uh, USDA certified organic thermal composting com class this spring. And hopefully we'll be able to produce some good thermal compost for our ladies uh, this, this coming winter. It's just been real rough getting that going with the, the health issues and stuff. But we look forward to, to getting those microbes pumped up even higher than they are right now. Oh, that's a nice looking, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, a de death cap, right? You know, I, I am not a skilled mycologist. I I could maybe tell you after a couple of hours of research, but I, I don't know, sir. Well, I just had them pop up in my yard. It's funny because you started growing mushrooms, and I was going to say, "What is that?" But then I saw that, and that's a that's a dead death that can kill you. One bite of that would kill you. And you tell by see how it's got the the gills. They call those gills. Yeah. Those gills are indicative of a poisonous mushroom. And if you look up the death cap, you will see that exact mushroom. And they look like a little ball at first. And after they grow for a few days, they get that big white and they got little bumps on the top. And that is a that is one of the most killer mushrooms out there. That's good to know. You will Speaking die. Speaking of mushrooms, Paul Stamis is going to be in Portland on Thursday. Oh, my gosh. I wish I was there. Wish I was gone. Oh, wow. If anybody's in Portland area, dude, Thursday, he's like from what, I, yeah, like he's going to be the, the, um, psychedelic people. What are their, points? <laughs> I can't, yeah, I think that's it. That would make sense. Well, wow. Yeah. I should see if I can get a ticket to that. That sounds excellent. Yeah. You should check it out. I wish I could go. I'm not going to be able to make it. Well, me well, make sure nobody eats that right. mushroom right there. That's yeah. Fine. Make sure. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. I was get bummed out. I can't go to the West Coast things yet, but uh, I do. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna try to make uh, Marty and and Steve's show out there, but we're not sure if we can be able to do it or not because we have to. So this picture. Oops, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. So that picture is actually a great example of a fail. I was so excited to pop those particular seeds that I used too much kelp in my solution and just cooked them, and they didn't germinate properly, and none of them made it. So. You know, even with organics, it's really important to remember that less is more. And and the more that I, I repeat that mantra and practice it in the garden, the better the plants seem to respond. So, well, there's something I'd like because I would teach never to do what you just said you do. So, why are you adding so much uh, nitrogen or whatever you know your kelp? Why are you adding so much to a seed when the seed doesn't have any roots to uptake anything at that point? Um, you know, typically, so so. Uh, one of the things a lot of people don't realize about kelp is, while well, kelp has macro and micronutrients in it, yeah. it's also, as a plant, loaded with plant growth hormones. So when using kelp in popping okay. seeds, we're after the growth hormones that are available to us from the kelp. Okay. But That's it's definitely a very, very minute amount is necessary, and I went right. way overboard with it in that case. So. <laughs> All right, thanks. I was just curious, me being a breeder and all, why you would do, why would you add something? To it? Yep, yeah. nope, it was just, a, you know, I want to give them the best start possible and got a little heavy handed and paid the price. <laughs> yeah, typically I don't usually use anything on my seeds. I, I like to do either yeah. a paper towel with plain water or, a, you know, the, the shot glass method. Um, with things that are particularly difficult or older seeds, uh, I've seen some of my friends recently have uh, success with some of the in vitro kits that are available. We've also had success with scuffing or scoring the seeds and then using a, a mycorrhizal product in yeah. association with that to really get them inoculated right out the gate. But one of the things that we also strive for is every single pack that we let out of our seeds is hand sorted. And we really try to make sure that every single seed that goes into a pack is going to be a, a, a viable germinating seed. And part of the way we do that is we, when we first have a batch of seeds come out, we'll germinate a lot of them just to see what germinates and what doesn't and going through that process and inspecting them really closely you can kind of learn at what point a seed is going to have you know not enough markings or be lightly colored enough that it's probably not going to be one that germinates and then we just kind of you know use that as a standard move it up to a few few rungs darker more striped seeds and kick out everything that doesn't look as good and typically we're able to make sure that people get 100 percent germination rate in their seed packs and to that end we also make sure that every seed pack has a couple of extra seeds just in case something doesn't pop. Cause when you pay for 10 seeds, our goal is that you actually get 10 viable plants out of that pack. Awesome. Awesome. Hmm. Yeah. Those other, uh, see okay, that red mushroom in the bottom left corner. That's a death cap too, before it popped open. Like that, that was okay. the same mushroom a few days before. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. Someone in chat just said that that the volume went back. Are we okay on audio, guys? Everything I hear okay? it fine. Everything okay. sounds great. I sound good. I hear you guys sure. good. Okay. Okay. Just I was making sure chat we were okay out there. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. No worries at all. So uh, I, I could talk about this stuff at, at great lengths, but if you all have any questions, any more questions too, please feel free to forward them. Yes, guys, if there's any questions in chat, please feel free to ask them out and we'll be sure to, but please, whatever picture you want to talk about, just tell me, grab it. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, beyond that, we'll, we can keep scrolling through them and we can uh, kind of move the, the subject to cannabinoid profiles next, actually. In brief. Ooh, I would love to talk that. Um, well, I want to real quick inject that your, your your information to contact you by email or however you want to be contacted will be listed in the description of the show. Awesome. So, yep. You don't have to worry about that. Fantastic. Audit profiles. So, um, you know, one of one of the things that, that is a big concern, especially in regards to actually trying to actively treat different conditions these days, is the, the cannabinoid profiles and ratios available from the plant. So many years ago, we were blessed with a, a cut of a, a plant called Frank's Gift, which is a skunk haze variety that was, if I'm not mistaken, found by the CBD crew and then gifted to an Oregon grower named Adam. And he subsequently spread it around the community after making sure it was good and stable for a few years. And so it's a plant that when grown really well, we've seen as high as 25% CBD and 7% THC in it. So that's a, you know, like a five to six to one ratio of CBD to THC. And so that's the only CBD plant that we currently work with in our garden, but it provides us a, a wide spectrum of possible cannabinoid ratios. So the first hybrid that we've made with that one here, we call Strange Angel. And we've seen plants that have up to 30% CBD, plants that have up to 30% THC and everything in between there. So our goal is going to be with that over the next year or so is to find two or three different very desirable cannabinoid profiles, probably a two to one of both CBD and THC. So like a 20 and 10 of both, and then a single one to one plant. And then those plants will then be selfed or, or reversed to try and stabilize those cannabinoid profiles for several, several generations until we can produce feminized seed stock where there's a really, you know, like a 90% chance that the seeds you pop are gonna give you a cannabinoid profile within 10% plus or minus of what we're saying on the package. I love that you've got that, you've got that idea already because that's some, that's the way I, that's the way I like to think. And a lot of people are starting to move in that direction where you're you got given different, you know, I mean, any of the good breeders I think are, are eyeing that, but not just going for the highest THC levels or the highest CBD levels, but finding different, like you said, uh, values, you know, that will, that can be skewed from one side to the other. Absolutely. And it's, you know, because in, in the future, larger farms and gardens, for the most part, aren't going to have a lot of need for seed stock, especially from outside sources. They're not really our concern going forward. And I'm happy to provide genetics to those kind of facilities and stuff. But the reality is the market for seeds at this point is the home grower. And, and most of us that are home growers, we don't have the budget to, to find the quality medicine that we need to feel better and subsequently we're left trying to find good genetics that we can produce at home for an affordable price and so that's kind of where where the niche that we're trying to fill right now is being able to get verified top quality genetics into the hands of people across the nation right now and hopefully soon we'll start being able to engage in more international shipping but to, to really enable the home grower to have world-class medicine they produce themselves for a fraction of the cost what it takes to engage in buying recreational cannabis. Perfect. I did. If Steve, are you still there? You got any more, any more questions on your so, list? Um, I oh. really like that you just started talking about Frank's gift because I have a friend that has it down there in Oregon and they talk really highly of it. And they just like, that's the one thing that his wife can only really have. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it is a miracle of a plant. I had grown a lot of CBD varieties before that, Harley Sue and uh, Sour Tsunami, Charlotte's Web, and they were decent plants. They, they produced, you know, very little THC, and they produced anywhere from 8 to 15% CBD. They had loose bud structures. They didn't support themselves in any way. The biggest production we could get out of a single 25-gallon pot in the medical garden indoors is probably around 18 ounces or so. And when we brought Frank's gift in, 
it still had the kind of the, ter- the, the classic cherry cough medicine terpene profile I associate with a lot of the original CBD genetics, but it also had hints of the haze and skunk that were in there from, from its parental lines. And it really added a, a whole new you know, layer to it. Plus it would support itself and we could produce up to three pounds off of a single plant in a 25 gallon pot indoors. Wow, and that's it, funny. You brought up Frank's gift too, Tara, and I'd add to this and ask some more because I think we had somebody on the show a while back that actually had something to do with that at some point, but I cannot remember. That's why I was asking Steve to step in. I thought yeah. we did. You know, I, I remember recognize that too as something. It, uh, there we uh, go. Was it Wade Laughter? Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to say. I just remember it being. T- we talked about that on the show, and it was supposed to be pretty special to you. Yeah. It might, might have been Wade, it. though, but I honestly don't remember, guys. I'm sorry. It was right, Wade, Wade, if I had to guess. <laughs> well, that's a, you can't just sit around watching all the shows to recap everything and remember. And so, this is another good example of uh, try, trying to better the cannabis gene pool. So this is a hybrid we call Dirty Dog, and it's the, the variegated or dirty Kim D cut crossed to our Starkiller OG male. It's phenomenal smoke. It's exceptionally potent. But when less than half of the phenotypes are either a good representation of one of the parents or an improvement on them, to me, it means that you're kind of diluting the gene pool by releasing them. So that was a strain that we never really put out to the public at all, just because even as good as the parents are, the combination didn't come out as nice as we wanted it to, so we held it back. Now, that doesn't mean that if we decide to work it to a second generation or use a different male with the Kim Dog D, that we might not be able to make a hybrid that we're, we're happy with and that presents the traits that we want, but this one just didn't hit the mark, and subsequently, we were not putting it out there because we feel like it would kind of be a step backwards for people. Well, that brought up a question for me. So when you're talking about hitting the mark, are you going actually, you know, do, are you doing lab testing on all these strains and how are you coming to the conclusion of what hits the mark and, and where are you getting your ratios from? Um, so when we're working with anything where we're concerned about cannabinoid ratios, so especially the frame skip hybrids and stuff, we absolutely use quantitative, quantitative lab analysis with those so that we can see what profiles we're working with because that's, that's really the only way to do that with those medicines. I mean, it's, it's really hard to, to smoke or eat something and say, oh, that's got 10% CBD in it. Whereas it's pretty easy to identify a strain that has twice as much THC as the one next to it, as far as the smoking experience goes. So when, when we talk about the high THC varieties and stuff like that, when it's within the budget, we absolutely try and use lab testing. But for the most part, the selections we make are usually largely based primarily on the terpene profile and then the growth characteristics out of the, the grouping that has the desired terpene profile. Okay. And are you doing any terpene testing or just deciding what you like? Is that what you're saying? When, when we use lab tests, we do terpene testing. And it's also something that uh, in the future moving forward, we'll probably be using as a good tool for the males we're selecting when we're trying to reproduce repro- specific terpene profiles from the females in a specific line. But at this point, it's nothing we've done. And honestly, it's, you know, the, the old school method has worked very well for us up to this point. Um, and and the part, part of the problem is I was involved with a lot of testing and stuff during the, the heyday of the medical stuff here in Oregon. And the, I, it, it's gotten better, but I don't feel it's especially reliable. And unless I'm running the machine myself at this point in time, I'm really not all that interested. So really, until we can afford our own chromatography setup, I don't have a lot of plans to be engaging in it too much more in the immediate future, outside of the work we're doing with CBD lines. I got you. I got you. So yeah, yeah and I'm sure there's a lot of the breeders that we've had on the show are going, yeah, that's right. I like to, I like to rub the stem too, because I think that's what you said earlier. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's been an especially good tool up to this point um in the future i would really actually like to start using some some uh ethylene inhibiting chemicals i I believe gibberellic acid can be used on male plants in flower to induce them into reversing and becoming female plants and that'll give us a really good idea of the terpene profiles available to us in the male by turning it to a female but again like i said before add but to add you don't want to smoke that afterwards right well Right? I mean, Isn't there something about that? I, it's very, very likely. I'm not super personally aware of, of the downsides of smoking 
flowers that have been sprayed with gibberellic acid. I know it sounds real bad, and I, I don't think there would be a lot of need to smoke it, honestly, because the, the live terpene profile should be enough for us to say, yes, that's it, or no, that's not what we're looking for. Okay, cool. I just wanted to throw that out there. Like, that wouldn't be a home test thing for people that are listening. Well, there's been a yeah, lot of crews that right? have done that in the past. It's a common thing that's running, if, you know, when you've been around thousands of people on forums and all that, that gets discussed every once every once in a while for a while, or there's an ongoing thread. But I think, Tara, to answer your question would be more like like a lot of things. What It depends on what you're going to use it for after you harvest or you, how you're going to process it possibly. You know, maybe you would well, want to do dab. So there, oh, here we go. Steve's going to tell us. How right. about crocusine? Oh, he's not going <laughs> to. Right, yeah, just part, part of the pollinator support garden outside of the greenhouse. It's beautiful stuff. I, I love the wildflowers around here. I can't get enough of them. So we'll be we'll be replanting all of that stuff again here in the near future. All righty. Well, um, is there any other thing else you want to mention before we wrap up the show? Uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I just, I thank you all very much for the opportunity to come and talk about my, my passion in life and making plants and stuff. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. I really appreciate having you on. That sounds like you put a long time and most of your life into it. And I'm glad you're getting some, yeah, it looks like you've done a real nice job and I love your, uh, mantra, you know, the, what your, your, your goal, you know, that your goals are right along the line of the best people I know. So I love it. For sure. I appreciate that. And to anybody that ends up ever listening to this, you know, to j just drop the name Potent Ponics when you reach out to us to get seeds and we'll make sure you get an extra discount. Really appreciate it. Cool. So how do they reach you? Oh, uh, so on Instagram, we're West Valley Seeds at West Valley Seeds. Uh, online, we're westvalleyseeds.com. Uh, and those are pretty much our, our two main presence at, at this point. We'll probably have a presence on uh, Calculator's new form, the Bean Basement, much sooner than later. Uh, we might join Twitter. Hopefully, you'll see us at booths at your, you know, your standard cannabis events here sooner than later. Awesome! Really appreciate it. Likewise, man. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Hey, man. Awesome having you. Likewise, y'all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, so what's uh, what's up with you, Tara? Before we wrap up the show. Ah, uh, what is up with me? Gosh, oh, I, oh, um, <laughs> I was just like, I'm so out of it. Like I'm halfway asleep here, trying to like pay attention to all this. The knowledge was crazy tonight. Okay, so uh, what's up with me? I unfortunately, I'm kind of out of kilter because. We had a chicken killer come into our yard, unfortunately. So I've been dealing with, uh, yeah, dogs come in and taking out some of my baby chickens. So, yeah, that's kind of put a little damper on my thing because I'm supposed to be packing and getting ready to go camping with my husband this weekend. And, and we're supposed to be getting away for that. And then I've got, I'm turning all my plants right now. I'm still dealing with russets. Um been talking with Dutch, uh, basically just keep spraying them down with water. That's what they're recommending because, uh, you know, I'm lucky because I'm not dealing with um, the mold here because I don't have the, the you know, humidity issues. Humidity. So I, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. So I'm able to deal with that. So luckily, uh, everything's looking good other than just one plant. I've only had one plant hit. Um, Everything's looking good. I'm, I, I, I have nothing to complain. Honestly, I have a nice, <laughs> I did some nice squishing the other night and yeah, I'm having a fantastic night. I hope y'all are having a fantastic night. What's up with you? What's going on with you guys? I just want to say, are you cold? you got a jacket on tonight. I have been cold all day. It's been, it has been um, chilly here all day and I got my, um, I'm sporting my roots. Got my roots on. Kaya, them here. Got you out there. Yeah. And yeah, so um, yeah, it's just that's it. It's been cold, so yeah, feeling cold. That's why I have my jacket on. Oh yeah, I guess it's cooling down, and yeah, you probably have colder nights than we might have already. Yeah. You're a, a, much higher yeah, elevation, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just so weird because when Josh was telling me it wasn't cold in the middle of winter last year, I was going, "This doesn't make sense." No, I'm in the desert part, so it, we get colder here in this area. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's going on with you? What What's up with you guys? 
Sorry about that. I don't know what the hell is going on with my. Yeah, yeah that just went staticky there. for a second. Sounds like you got tired or something. No, a stat I heard a static. Thing. Yeah, I heard it like a call. Sorry about that. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, I good. did something all of a sudden and my audio was all whacked for a second. So, hey, well, all I'm doing is uh, we're going to our, we're going through our hemp certificate. Well, the hemp certification is already a license in place, but I'm going through the hemp certification for my farm to be added to the to the main company, and that's what, basically what I've been doing. It's been really hot since the hurricane, and we're now going to start. It's kind of funny. It was 90 something degrees today, and tomorrow it's supposed to be like 77, and then which is going to be nice. It's going to be in high 70s to low 80s the rest of the week. So we're going to kind of start hitting fall, it looks like, finally. And, uh, and uh, the, you know, all my produce is doing pretty good. I have, <clears throat> it looks like I had, um, yeah, I had some kind of uh, worm or, you know, caterpillar eat the hell out of all my pepper plants and a lot of my tomato plants too, which is odd. It's usually one or the other. <clears throat> but I was surprised so much of the pepper plants got all the foliage got ate off of them but then we had the hurricane too uh but it was already being damaged but uh yeah i'm still waiting because i can't wait to start oh in fact there's something i want to say uh, my partner was in chat on youtube tonight and uh, we had a phone conversation earlier uh when brock was on still and he had said that well we've got a cache of the autopilot seeds that he was talking about so that's interesting he said we might have even got them from him or or wherever the company he's talking about getting them from so i thought that was pretty neat so we'll have something to compare there how it grows and some the way i grow to compared to the way he grows and i had a i had a question for you so when i had posted a picture of um i started trickling some pictures out it's just some stuff i've seen this year um I, have you seen ever heard of nolo bait? Nolo bait? Yeah. Uh, what is it? It's a it's a some kind of paramecium or something that's on a bait for grasshoppers and and um, locusts and katydids and that kind of stuff. No, I haven't seen that. Are you recommending that, or you just wanted to know if I knew? I don't know. Someone just uh, suggested it to me. I didn't know if I had never heard of it before, but it sounded pretty cool, and it seems like a a natural solution for them. And we have issues with them and in, in cannabis. So, so is it a bait like for a trap, Steve, or something you spray? It's a bait. You put the bait bait. out at the base of the plants. Oh man, I could have used that. A about a month ago. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's just something new I just found out about today. I just thought I'd mention well, can it. Can you post show. that either in the description or it's in called, the chat? It's called Nolo Bait. N O L O Bait. Okay. All right. I got you. Simple enough. Right, NoloBait.com if you All want right. to find out more info. I'll try it because I got nothing to lose on a couple of tomato plants or something like that, you know. But but I don't know, how's it, have you read up on it at all, like about testing? It's microbial base that specifically oh. targets grasshoppers. Okay, I'll look into that, I'll wait, and I will do some testing on it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I think everybody would love, so I bet their stock's going up tomorrow night, you know, after a few thousand people listen to the show. Oh, I oh. did forget, earlier in chat, someone did mention cannabis. Yes, I am on cannabis and Instagram. And I think and Potent's on. Potent, are you on cannabis yet? Yes, I'm on both. And actually, I was just hanging out with JR a couple days ago. Uh, yes, you were. That's right, you were. On Sunday, actually, yeah, on Sunday, hanging out with JR. Hung out with Fish Ganja Guy. Shout out to Fish Ganja Guy. Cool. He was kind enough to invite us over. We had a smoke sesh. It was a lot of fun. So... Yes, and I'm hanging out with a JR on Wednesdays now on a live. We've decided to do a live together on Wednesdays at 4 o'clock. Cool. And you're invited if you'd ever like to join us. Cool. So, well, yeah. We had a, a little sesh with some other, some other friends from Instagram and the community over at the Northwest Cannabis Club on, on Sunday night. And Fun. had a chance to hang out with uh, – with, um, 
with Beth. That was fun. And then got a chance to hang out with um, uh, Josh. Um, Steensland. Uh, Steensland. That was a lot of fun seeing his farm. And uh, uh, he has a hundred and some acres. Go oh, check it out. Check out the pictures, guys, on Instagram. Yeah. Potent post pictures. I'm so jealous. Yeah, and he he did all also on Facebook. That was an like awesome picture. It was, it was also really, yeah. It's also really cool to see uh, hemp interplanted with blueberries. That was pretty cool. And then also pretty neat, they had a really interesting solution. Uh, so they have starlings that I guess attack the grapes and some of the other crops there. So they have big speakers, and the speakers play starlings that are getting injured or attacked or killed by hawks and other predators so but they're on loudspeakers so you hear like dying starlings and other things but there is no <laughs> birds flying anywhere near this farm except for predator birds it, it really is really interesting and different so okay so. so that would have to be really annoying if you lived by there i would just have to say yeah oh yeah well you don't want to live by your field <laughs> Well, hey, what if you're out in the middle of like these acres and you have a farmhouse and you and and a person next to you decides they want to farm these things? I mean, that's things that we need to all consider, right? You need to only run them during the day. Oh, well, yeah, but still. Sam, yeah, stay yeah. at home. Play your music louder or wear uh, headphones. <laughs> with that or well, like okay, there is off. another way that they can control it, by the way, because I know some other people down there in Oregon, and they actually control their berry farms. They hire uh, those hawks falconers. to come in to take. Yeah, falconers. Thank you for that. Yeah, and they actually, I heard they charge twenty thousand a year for yeah. uh, to come in and do that. So. That wouldn't surprise me at all. So it's similar to a, a service like hiring a beekeeper to bring the bees in during your pollination period every yeah. year. Yeah, very it's interesting. Become very hard these days. But yeah, that's interesting. The, you, falconers, that's that's interesting. But bring in birds of prey to hang out while you're de dealing with this. But I, I, I can see the thing. Well, that's a really that's a really Nazi kind of concept there. Like we're gonna play music till you go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all won't come around this field. It was working though. There wasn't a single. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay. And so total good natural solution. Yeah. Down another rabbit hole. They're playing these in places so people, the homeless people, won't hang out at night. Supposedly, I've heard in areas they're testing yep. it out. Yeah. Yep. They Make have ones too. Sad, that are, they have ones too that just annoy teenagers as well. They're playing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, I've heard this. No, that's, that's terrible. No, I hadn't seen this yet. I love this. I, oh, my God. They were using psycho warfare on people now. Right. Oh, yeah. Total psycho warfare. Right. That's a name for a band. Yeah. Oh, and that, you know what's funny, though? So I've been to some, allegedly been to some protests where they use the sonic guns, the big giant trucks with the, yeah. with the sound guns. And I got to tell you, they, have these cops, like, are they aware of what dubstep is and like modern electronic music? Because compared to the shit these kids listen to, that ain't shit. Like straight up, like <laughs> it's just not, it, it just, it's mildly annoying compared to some of the music that kids listen to these days. As far as like, it just, there's, it's totally ineffective against the youth. Oh, that's like, the point you were wanting to make. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. So, but anyways, um, hopefully, uh, before too long, be able to start talking about this new project. Uh, I know I'll be talking about it this weekend. Um, I don't know what day our press release is going out. I think Friday now. It was supposed to come out a couple Wednesdays ago, but some good things happened. So we had to uh, add some things. So it's always good. So um, that'll be announced. And yeah, we're doing all kinds of fun stuff soon. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap up the show. Um, on Thursday, we have, oh, what's his name? Hold on a second. This guy runs a really cool pest management channel. Uh, ah. With a Z. Hold on a second. Well, we'll have to ask him about no low bait. Sink what Angel. Sink Angel will be joining us. He has a YouTube channel, Zenthanol. Or Zen, yeah, Zenthanol. Um, if you guys are familiar yes, with Zenthanol, that's it. Yes. Channel, is that uh, Z as in Z like Zen or X? He has, he has an incredible 
um, YouTube channel and reference material and Instagram for pests and pest management. He's one of the best. Um, he's going to be joining us on the show on Thursday for an interview. Cool. Is he a mycologist? Not yeah. mycologist, entomologist? Yep, I believe yeah. so. Oh, okay. If not, he does a hell of a good job of covering everything. Well, or he has a panel of it. Either way, yeah. He, yeah, I can't wait. That's going to be I'll, be I'll be here to educate us. Uh, if, if he is, I, I apologize. Oh, he's, he, yes, he's an entomologist, mycologist, and botanist. Oh, so, man, badass. That's what, that's what, um, and yeah. Crop consultant. So that'll be really awesome. He's a really fucking cool dude, super knowledgeable, and I'm really excited to have him on the show. Um, and uh, finally, I uh, got him to come on, so we'll have him on on Thursday. Yeah, he's uh, been doing a couple of talks, and he uh, met him. He's re he is really very knowledgeable. He's put a lot of good information out on YouTube for free. It's been really, really good guy. Well, it's perfect timing, just like tonight was perfect timing. We're into this building, this hemp farm, and all these three locations. And I, the biggest thing I needed, because I've always been able to handle it in my little small, alleged small grow, you know, or what I, even my, you know, greenhouse, I never really had a problem with a lot, I, you know, a problem here, a problem there. Um, but right now trying to hit when you're trying to look at looking, maybe, you know, trying to, although you're not going to do it this year, you're looking at how you're going to manage a hundred acres or 300 acres and you're going, wow, you know, this is, you can just, so my, my biggest thing right now is uh, with all the other ideas I'm trying to study and, and master a little bit uh, is that, Pest management. So this is perfect timing. We already know we got bug lady Suzanne Wainwright. You know, if we got a if we got a pest problem and we got the bug, we she can tell us what bug to get to kill it. Um, but it's gonna be nice to find it. You know, hear from somebody different. Pest management. You know, that's doing really well. And I, you say it's it's like uh, breaking kind of you know like landmark kind of stuff he's doing. Yeah, there's all kinds of cool stuff on his channel. So. All right, so uh, why don't why don't you tell everybody how to find you there, Tara? Uh, every now and then I'm here on Tuesdays and Thursdays when Potent has a show and we hang out. And I'm on Tara Lee Live on my YouTube channel and on Instagram and go live on Wednesdays every now and then, hopefully, get a schedule going. Thanks for having me tonight, guys. Awesome. It's always a pleasure. Well, what about you, Roger? I'm uh, well. I'm on Instagram a little bit. Um, uh, I well, you can find me at ilovegrowingmarijuana.com. We run a great forum there. Very knowledgeable. Lo lots of members. Lots of sharing members. That and a very polite and um, humble type forum for the most part. Um, so everything you need to know, you can go there and log in if you want to have that kind of little bit of a lifestyle. Uh, you can buy, get into grow journals and check out what everybody's doing to learn, figure out if you're a new grower, what kind of technique you might want to, you know, decide to invest in. Um, I'm also on Cannabuzz. Uh, I actually was already on Cannabuzz when JR was on the show the other day. Um, well, I think it was last week sometime. And uh, I, so I went there and double checked and I am, I just haven't been very active there. Cause I just started getting my um, different things all set up for uploading to Instagram and Cannabis and places like that. I've always been able to do pictures, but once I started doing audio because of the high quality of my camera, it's harder cause you have to convert it to a smaller file. So anyway, um, all righty. Oh, I oh I thought we I, all the pictures went away, so I I didn't realize. No, I only stopped because I thought suddenly we went off air or I lost it. Oh. But anyway, that's it. Um, I love growing marijuana dot com. Uh, you, you'll also be able to reach me soon through the Carolina uh, Carolina Canna Connection, which is K A N E H, the Latin spelling of Canna. Um, um, very soon on a website, so look for that soon. And and um, I can't wait to get into the industry you know both, both with both feet but yeah i think we're all getting tired for sure man and hasn't right. been that long of a night has it you can find me at potent Pong's youtube soundcloud itunes spotify 
all the other places that you like to listen to podcasts and video on YouTube. We'll be back again on Thursday, and we'll see you guys again soon. Peace.